Spear. Make a wooden spear. Just a pointy stick. Okay. Improvise wooden spear. Put that in my hands. Okay. But it's something. <sighs> this is so dangerous. Wait, where are How you? How are you ever going to have friends fo over? Follow the trench around. <laughs> oh! <laughs> 50 more or something. I don't know. Actually, this is very important. Did that monkey just commit suicide rather than be in my presence? <laughs> Ooh, an untouched pawn shop, everybody. Bullets, a shit ton of bullets. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Okay. Right, let's get the car loaded up. How do you go full auto on? Shot! Ow! Oh, help me, help me, help me, there's a guy in there. Where is he? In there, somewhere. Pick me up! Grenade, grenade, grenade! Guys, stop just looking at me, pick me up! We can't do anything. <laughs> you fucking penises! <laughs> Quick. Another predator was just in front of me. I hope he's not hungry. What's this thing? Is that a rock or something? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, not a rock. Very quietly tiptoe away from the giant predator. Survival games. I love them. Piss off, piss off, piss off, piss off, piss off, piss off. I really love them. Looks like a red oh, 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 Jesus Christ, I'm toast! <laughs> I'm out! Fuck it! We all have our personal tastes in media, right? Our favourites? Well, this one is mine. Take a group of players, or just one, it varies, sprinkle down some items to keep them alive, give them a bunch of complicated hoops to jump through, and health bars to maintain, and then, from a development perspective, do nothing. Leave it entirely to the player's initiative. Yes! Oh, I got him! I have anything that I- Whoa, okay. When one stands stock still in a World War II shooter or something, the setting just freezes around you until the next enemy spawn point is hit, the Nazi war machine coming to a humiliating halt with your inaction. But do the same in a survival game and the world will just keep existing. It doesn't care what you do, and you have to be the one to take actions to stay alive in it. And that rule is replicated across everybody playing in that world. Everyone is having their own, sometimes fiercely unique, play experience. I like that. You never feel as though the eyes of the developers are peering in on you. I'm coming down here, dude. I don't want to die, though. We're not going to shoot you. When he comes down, and shoot him. Open world survival games are sometimes called walking simulators, and yeah, they can be that. But the thing is, you can often go in any direction and potentially something interesting might happen. And that does wonders for the replay value. You could be roaming around and gathering equipment, maybe finding some treasure sealed behind a mechanism. And as you're working on figuring out how to undo it, suddenly three knobheads turn up outside the control room, all heavily armed. But they're not here for you. They're just after the same batch of treasure that you're trying to get. And just like that, your personal stories have crashed together through geographical proximity. You're in an unscripted, unplanned Mexican standoff, the results of which are not predetermined. It's nothing like the traditional open world adventure game, where you activated the siege quest, followed the waypoint, and then the developer's idea of a quest plays out. The fact that it's emergent gameplay, the fact that it's raw and unscripted, makes it so much more interesting. And in survival games, these sorts of things are happening all the time. The situation I'm describing? That happened last year we played on the clan's Rust server, except I was one of the knobhead bandits. In the, he's in the control tower. Moving right, and moving control. right. Make, make sure you can't get out. Ladder goes up. Yeah, he's, he's up. Flank. Drop your weapons if you want to live. Drop your weapons. <laughs> oh! All I'll cover the stairs. You guys figure something else out. Just keep like, him busy. You can't keep him busy forever. Yes, you can. Okay, hang on. I'll try. Have um, have you seen Game of Thrones? No. Ah. Oh. Can't get past the opening scene. I hate it. What? The, the, the opening I've scene? The, the opening scene is great. Yeah. We have to kill this man. Anyway, I, I love this stuff. Lucky for me then that come 2013, we saw a slew of open world games arrive on the market. And I know I've talked a lot about it before, but many of them were trying to work with some sort of a gimmick to distinguish themselves from the competition, some secret ingredient that put their gameplay atop an ever-growing pile. Some would stick close to the mod that spawned it, keeping that Eastern European flavour in this cold and lonely zombie apocalypse. Some would focus on that zombie threat, making it continue continually escalating, along with degrading access to luxuries such as power or running water. Some would focus on the hoarding of equipment in specialised structures, making it very possible to raid them, making everyone besiege one another, like a server of naked stone-carrying medieval squirrels. Some would take the external survival threat and make it tameable, essentially turning the enemy that's meant to challenge you into a form of vehicle to augment your mobility. Some would cut the corners off to get to the weapons, and therefore the shooting, much, much 
much faster. Some would divide the players into combat classes, but have some of them nearly incapable of surviving on the resources on the map, forcing them to literally eat the other players in order to exist. <laughs> <laughs> and I found myself fascinated to see all of the little tricks and gimmicks that various studios were having to come up with in order to compete. This wasn't really a battle fought with marketing, where you could just throw money at advertising in order to keep a persistent population interested, one had to instead be clever. And during all of this, from time to time, I would get the occasional question pop up in my Twitch chat. Are you going to try X survival game again? after they've added the story. Story? In this genre? I mean, it's not to say that you can't, it's just that you don't really need to. Everyone is essentially having their own independent, intensely personal story. Oh no, oh no, run! 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 Oh no, all right, we're done. Holy fuck! Holy fuck! Shit, I got it from! No! No, just run as much as you can! Oh. No! No, 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 no! I'm sorry! I'm sorry! No! No! <laughs> that was so fucking cool! That was so fucking awesome! But, sure enough, some of these early access survival games were working to add stories. Subnautica was apparently working quite hard on it. The forest intended to include a story of what brought down the player's plane on that island full of cannibal NPCs. The Isle wants to tell a story of how the place got covered with dinosaurs. And this idea, this concept of open world survival games including stories, I just kind of ignored it. I didn't think it was going to happen until the first one on that list list actually did it. Subnautica added a story. It became a small footnote of a potential video idea. Can you add a story to a genre that's not just defined by the lack of one, but it's arguably stronger because it's defined by the players? And what happens if you do? So with these questions in mind, I got back in the mood to try Subnautica. Subnautica is an open-world survival game released into Early Access in December of 2014. It was made by a relatively small team in America, and in the game you play as Riley Robinson, a crew member aboard the futuristic space vessel the Aurora. And in the opening cutscene, you have to perform an emergency crash landing on an unexplored ocean planet known as 4546B. You have suffered minor head trauma. This is considered an optimal outcome. Your drop pod splashes down into a semi-random location on an expansive open map, and you have to do your best to try and stay alive. PDA has now rebooted in emergency mode with one directive, to keep you alive on an alien world. Good luck. Straight off the bat though, the team were able to distinguish their product with the setting, an open ocean, something that competitors hadn't thought of complete with reefs, sandbars, oceanic trenches, and deep lava tubes. I played Subnautica in May of 2016, about a year and a half after its early access release, and it was actually very good. Here's me successfully driving a submarine. They're meant to sink as the submarine. This is fine. <laughs> we are properly sinking. Oh god, look at that. That's awesome. <laughs> The player not only has to try and stay alive long enough to be rescued, jumping through the hoops of finding sufficient water and food, but they also have to better themselves and their survival situation by finding additional pieces of technology, notably ways to get around the ocean faster. With the explosive crash landing and subsequent explosion of the Aurora's drive core serving as a good excuse to get all of this stuff scattered all over the place. Also, some months after their early access release, they'd put in the ever popular survival feature of base building, expanding the survival thing of having a safe home, cozy and well supplied versus the wild and hostile outside environment. Base building games are popular for many reasons, but that is a big one. Even in ones that are overtly PvP, you have your patch, you know, your stomping ground. All in all, I really enjoyed Subnautica. I had a great time. I thought the unique visual twist of the ocean gave exploration a sense of immersive terror that no other survival game was trying. The natural fear that many of us have of deep water and the things that lurk in it.
and the developer's attention to detail concerning codex entries for the various species of fish that you can scan. Seek fluid intake immediately. More important things right now! Coupled with the ability to clad yourself in vehicular armor, with the largest subs being outright immune to attack, at the time at least, meant that the initial trepidation that you faced exploring was gradually replaced by wonder, like a biologist exploring a vibrant fictional food chain. Ow, do you mind? A really bitey fictional food chain. Oh jeez, fuck off! A really, really bitey fictional food chain. No, 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 no! Oh my god, get off! Bad touch, bad touch, bad touch! Abandon ship! Swim, swim away, swim away! Oh, oh, you're kidding me! God damn fish. Now after 2016, I moved on to other things, my audience made me gradually aware that Subnautica had since worked to put in a story, adding the various elements for it over the course of 2017, and eventually completing the game by January 2018, and I was kind of intrigued. Here, potentially, I might be able to get some of the answers to those questions that I had about adding a story to a survival game. What does that actually, you know, look like? What sort of pitfalls are involved? Are there any quirks that arise by adding a narrative structure to a genre that's really defined by the ability to just go in any direction and find stuff, you know, see what happens? So, I loaded up Subnautica again, I think in 2020, and I dived back in. So the most interesting thing to talk about, I think, is the genre selected for the story. It's mystery. The Aurora suffered orbital hull failure, cause unknown. The story is infused with mystery. Scans of damage to the Aurora do not match any known offensive technologies. Without wishing to go into heavy spoilers for Subnautica, because it's excellent and I strongly recommend you play it, Riley, the survivor, discovers that he can't actually leave, even if a rescue ship arrives that day. No ship can move in and out of the atmosphere for reasons that I won't explain, and trying to figure out why is what leads you down a rabbit hole, discovering this giant strain to the breaking point Rube Goldberg plot machine that has you trying to figure out the missing piece. And when you get to that point, when you see the mystery laid out in front of you, and you can see the writer's design, it can be quite satisfying. Especially when you realise that if you merely do something simple, you can unblock the jammed plot apparatus and make all the difference in the world. And this actually graphs really well onto the open world nature of the game. I already mentioned that you naturally explore and find survival tools and equipment, swimming apparatus and base building segments or vehicle parts. We can probably search the area for pieces of technology. But now, because the story is a mystery, the authors are able to fragment the clues in a similar way and then scatter them across the map in the same fashion. And to facilitate that, they've overhauled the way in which the vehicles work quite dramatically. Back in 2016, your big submarine could just go wherever. Once you had it, that was it. You could really just go wherever you want. But now though, they've carefully tweaked the crush depth for each individual vehicle, and you can bounce along in the shallows with your little sea moth submarine. Ta-da! Thank you, drones. Meet the Seamoth. Welcome aboard, Captain. But if you want to go deeper, you're going to need specific minerals for the depth modules. Well, where are they? Well, you go back to your base and you build a scanner device. Oh, they're in these biomes over here, away from the shallows. Okay, so you need to go there. You need to spend time in these biomes. Next clue needs you to go deeper. Well, you're going to need the big sub. More clues down there. Is that it? No, because your big sub can't actually fit down the tight tunnels that are present in the endgame. Tight, narrow lava tubes, that sort of thing. But you can carry a mining suit called a prawn. Dropping. And you can then deploy that from the large sub to explore the close quarters areas. They've tailor-made your modes of transportation to not simply be fast, faster, and then even faster, but to deal with different environmental challenges. I'm sorry, what is that? There's a bug attached to the front of the prawns. Do you mind? The fuck off. No. Fuck off. Fine. What's that sound? There better not be another one. It's not another one on me. Oh, for fuck's sake! Another thing they've chosen to do is that they direct the players with nav markers. You'll periodically get radio messages from the other survivors of the Aurora, telling you that they've crash-landed somewhere and they need your help. And a 3D marker will appear on your heads-up display. This is LifePod 3, uploading our coordinates. We're plugging some holes in our emergency sea glide, so if we're late for the rendezvous, don't panic. Also, don't go home without us. Seriously. 
Three out. Lifepod 3, Shallows, crew report their sea glide damaged at 365 metres. You'll usually arrive to find that the pod is either abandoned or damaged or destroyed by the local megafauna. But you see, the survivors aren't really the point. The point is to direct you to the biomes that you've not explored, to find more survival items and add to your pile of questions and clues. Fucking thing, fuck, fucking everything on this planet doesn't have personal boundary. Fucking fuck off! with lots of audio diaries to keep you invested in discovering what exactly happened here. I don't know what the heck is happening. I'm scared and I'm not going outside. There are shadows in the water under the hatch, but I can't tell if they're rocks or aliens. The Aurora was carrying everything needed to build the phase gate. I don't know why no one's coming for me. It's clever. They've diegetically used the challenges of ocean exploration and the calls for help in a desperate survival situation in tandem with the type of storytelling which allows for a non-linear acquisition of plot points to tell a story that is infused with mystery and leaning into the fact that players can, and probably will, lay waste to whatever story narrative you had in mind if you try to tell one linearly. Uh, do you, sir, sir, do you mind? You've got like the whole ocean to float in do you have to float in my back garden? Piss off! No, you can't come in. You want to go in the aquarium? You're not going to fit! You can see the fingerprints of a developer, realising that they need to adapt the story to appropriately fit the medium. What are you doing? Go home, reef back, you're drunk. One thing I really noticed though, the main thing that I want to talk about with Subnautica's plot, it's um, it's quite tacked on. It's kind of tricky to explain without direct spoilers, so I'm going to do a hypothetical. Let's say you're exploring a river in search of cool survival stuff, and you're finding that the river is mostly unchanged since the last time you dropped into the game some years ago. But now, this time, you find that in the middle of the river is a half-sunken pirate ship. The unexpected presence of the pirate ship isn't accidental, it's out of place on purpose for the shock value, and it's full of really important plot points and revelations. But um, it's not like baked into the environment in a way that comes across as natural. This pirate ship could be anywhere. This could be on land, we could be on the beach, this could be in a dry dock, this could be on the moon, because it's all kind of self-contained. You enter the pirate ship, some cutscenes play as you look around, and then you leave. Tone-wise, there may as well be a kathunk sound where the plot stuff starts and the survival stuff stops. It's not really tied to the environment, if that makes sense. And lots of places in Subnautica are just like that. All endgame related, you enter an area, find something that looks a bit out of place, plot happens, and then you return to the game world. And so the cogs in my brain start to turn gently. Is that a consequence of it being a late addition? Like, they couldn't easily change the map layout, but they can add a pirate ship and make the plot happen in there. So that kind of gets me thinking. Are all of the open world survival games that have their stories added after their early access going to feel a bit like that? Will they lean heavily on mystery as a primary genre? Will player freedom be intentionally corralled to stop them racing off to find the really critical clues too soon? Will player attention be directed in specific ways, using diegetic reasons for the player to be headed in one particular direction? And will the story elements take place in locations that feel just a little bit shoehorned in? As in, if I play The Forest from 2014, which has since also had its story retroactively added, will the main plot elements take place on, like, an oil rig or something? It was a minor thought, nothing major. Maybe it might make an interesting video one day. Looking at some of the stories added to open world survival games launched without them, to see if they use similar solutions to similar problems. And then one day, I was very, very bored. As you can probably tell I'm rather bored. There appears to be a bird inside this plane. Okay. I played it back in, oh god, like December 2014? I even made a bullshittery with it. Oh look, dead cannibal. Hmm? Where? So, sorry, wh what are we meant to be doing? This time though, it was late 2020 and I streamed it. Whoops, sorry. I streamed all of it. Oh my god, I'm a dumbass, I really- I enjoyed it. Oh! <laughs> Hey! And after 27 hours, I finished it. And then I went insane. Uh... I, that's... <laughs> um... Okay, I thought that... I, so... Is there no, like... <laughs> I, I don't know what to say. Um, sorry. I, I, 
So the game, right? Mm. <laughs> okay, I'm very. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm crushed. Forgive me. I'm actually incredibly disappointed. I, it was doing so well. Okay. Um, I, I don't know what this video is. Like, um, I had a plan. That was my plan. What I just said about Subnautica. And I would have a look at the survival games with their stories added in post. And see if there was anything worth talking about. And then I played The Forest. And I feel as though I've been sent into a tailspin. We all like to rub a neck a trash fire, right? I mean, YouTube is full of that. But that's not really what this is. Because The Forest is actually good. At times, very, very good. And um, I, I feel like I'm in that scene from Indiana Jones. Where I've confidently stepped forward. Only to find that my foot has fallen through into a pit of logic so profoundly weird that delving deeper into this specific rabbit hole is arguably more interesting now. Would you just let me ramble, really? Um, I think this is more just for my sanity? So the forest entered early access in May of 2014, and like Bioshock before it, it starts with a bang. From that plain out you step, outwards into the light of the forest, only to find no sign of any other passengers. They've all presumably been carried off, even the dead, except for you and this one woman of course. And even now, the player's head is no doubt burning with questions. Why did the plane crash? What brought it down? Where are we? And who the hell was the man that took my son? And where was he taking him? The answers won't be forthcoming for the time being. Instead, the player is able to look over their surroundings. They might find that they're near a cliff and note that there's an ocean. They'll probably discover that they can use their axe to smash open some luggage containers, finding junk food and water enough to maintain themselves for the moment. The brightly coloured luggage that's scattered around encourages you to look at your feet, where you'll also start finding basic resources. You also come with what appears to be a children's book with instructions on how to survive. Presumably it was Timmy's, and it serves as a diegetic, as in in-universe reason, for why the player character would look to say, build a small shelter. No, not on my camp! Oh no! Exploring around for a bit, you'll find a yacht anchored in a bay. Who owns this yacht? And next to that you'll find a grave with a bunch of photographs scattered on it. Whose grave is this? Picture of a boat. That boat. Who's taking all the photographs? Weirdly, you'll also probably notice a few environmental details, or at least I did, that might come across as very unusual. There are sharks, lots of sharks, not little ones, full-grown great white sharks just lying dead on the beach, as though they died from some mass poisoning. My first thought was a storm, but I mean, the yacht looks undamaged. Why are there dead sharks on the beach? Let's go check out that boat. Boarding the yacht, you'll find a very strange scene. There are human remains everywhere. The kitchen is covered in gore. A human head sits on a plate on the table, facing upwards, carefully posed like that. And the game draws attention to a milk carton on the table, with a quizzical tone, even holding it up to the camera. Who's the boy on the carton? Does that imply that they were also looking for a missing boy? There's a card reader for a cabin that you cannot access. Also, there's a picture on the wall. A children's drawing signed by someone called Megan. Megan Cross. Who is Megan Cross? Someone who's gone missing? Returning to the beach, you'll probably feel inclined to set up a small shelter, which lets you save. The game, straight off the bat, really focuses on ambience, on atmosphere. 
Everything feels claustrophobic, even when you're outdoors. The trees feel like they close in, and the audio design is excellent, with rumbling ocean waves and fierce winds encouraging you to build something to retreat to for safety, particularly as you spot other people moving in the forest. And when you can't see them, you'll certainly hear them. Who are they? Who are the tribals? And later that chorus is joined by other, stranger sounds. I hear something thumping. Something roaring. Is it a bear? And for my particular playthrough at least, there was a deep guttural rumbling from time to time, never sticking around for long, but always noticeable. Listen very carefully, and you'll hear it. <laughs> Oh, I'm so <laughs> sorry. Woo. It's probably at this point that you as a player will have a small shelter and probably a small fire. And it's also at this point that you as the player will probably start to poke the world with a stick for a little bit to see what mechanics you're dealing with. <laughs> it's cool that you can actually hit the sharks and the game does recognize that you want to take their heads off. And also it's kind of cool that the turtle has its own hitbox. Can you please just... There we go. Yeah. But it's also at this time that you'll probably notice that something's a bit, like, off? Okay, um, I don't want to interrogate video game logic, because, you know, <laughs> sometimes it's video game logic. I ate a Russian glow cap and it charged up my batteries. Huh? But from time to time, you'll notice something really just weird. As in stuff that you'll find really difficult to ignore, or at least I did. For example, you'll quickly discover that there's a crafting screen and it lets you combine different objects to produce upgrades for stuff. That's like really normal survival genre stuff. Rocks, what can I make with the rocks? Burning weapon. Burning weapon? What is this? How does this help? Okay. Oh, uh, 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 oh no, 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 it doesn't help. That doesn't help at all. What the fuck? Ow! <laughs> That was not useful! So then you ponder to yourself, what could you combine with your axe? The game tells you that you can do that. In fact, starting off with the small number of items in your inventory, that's probably one of the first things you'll try to upgrade. Well, in order to upgrade the damage, you need human teeth. I'll add teeth for more damage. And you take tree sap to stick them onto the axe head. And when I say to stick them onto the axe head, I mean like just stick them onto the axe head. Not even on the blade, just just anywhere. Not sure that would really help versus the cutting edge, but okay. You used to be able to define where to put them, but that's been taken out, apparently. Now it's just, you know, all over the axe. Just human molars sitting there. Small tangent. During my time in software quality assurance, there was this phrase repeated in my training. Quality is everyone's concern. It's simply a mindset that a quality assurance analyst needs to try and promote within the team. That quality, as nebulous as that sometimes is, isn't something left right until the end of the process where it's no doubt more expensive to fix, but that the rituals of quality assurance, the running of the tests, the, uh, the checking of requirements, the critical looking at things and saying, should we do it like that? It's an ongoing process, from scoping to final implementation. Quality is everyone's responsibility, not merely the guys with it in their job title. So when I see something like this, I know it's a small team, but I would expect at least that it's gone through a couple of people, right? At least a couple of pair of eyes have looked at that and gone, yeah, human teeth makes acts better, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then jumping ahead quite a bit, later on in the game you're able to find a sword, a real sword, sharp as anything, and you get the opportunity to upgrade it, and if you found poison berries, you can get the option to apply poison berries to the blade, like smear the poison on the blade or whatever. But then the game just lets you <laughs> literally apply poison berries, as in like a, like a, a, a bunch of berries just clipping into the blade. <laughs> That's your idea of poisoning it, just sticking a few berries on the end. <sighs> This guy, I tell you. Again, I, I don't want to get hung up on this shit because we're going to be here forever. But it's moments like this that make you go, huh? 
To further the weirdness though, not in technical implementation this time, but in, like, core concept, consider the central premise that I've just walked you through. You've just been involved in a major plane crash which has resulted in the death or injury of a lot of people. You even get a manifest later telling you how many, and that the crash site was set upon by an unknown group, one of whom abducted your son along with all of the others. You'd want to find your son, right? Timmy's photo. Ugh. Jesus Christ, are we sure we want to save him? Okay. But like, why aren't you calling for help? The book gives you an option to build a giant SOS sign that can be spotted from the air, and you can indeed spot low-flying civilian airliners, so you know you're not that far from civilization. Also, they never spot you. Like, ever. Why is it the planes cannot see the crash? But wouldn't you, at the very least, be on the lookout for some means of attracting direct help to your location? Not even just for you, necessarily, but for the dozens of people who might be alive and in need of search and rescue. You literally stumble upon an intact yacht, presumably one that has a satellite phone, and later on you find campsites with laptops and other electronics, some of which actually have power, any number of which no doubt contain at least one mobile phone, and you never have the option to even look. Ah oh, damn, I guess it's a shame the cockpit flew into the ocean. I guess that rules out the chance of finding a radio. No, you literally find the cockpit later. It's up on the side of the mountain. It's in bad shape, yeah, but uh, you can't interact with it and you can't check its radio. I, I don't want to get twisted in knots over it, but like, the central premise is that you're stranded and presumably you want to get unstranded. And you trip over half a dozen ways to make that so. You can even find a helicopter later, a crashed helicopter, seemingly unburnt and mostly undamaged, with no attempt to look for its radio. Instead, it has a machete upgrade. Uh? How did Subnautica handle this situation? Well, it literally had you call for help. Take the repair tool. Don't poke it. Right, radio. They thought of it. They clearly thought of it. You call for rescue. It'll take us a couple of days to align our orbit. We should be able to establish direct contact with you during that time. Then we're coming in to get you. Don't leave us waiting. Sunbeam out. And the countdown to the rescue ship arriving and then its inability to get down to you is tied into the central mystery. But in the forest, it's not. They just really want you to find Timmy. <laughs> Alone, apparently. Obviously strange logic, and it kind of unintentionally suggests that there's something a little bit wrong with your character. So why not just make a no- <laughs> He has the candles, what was, what's with the skull? And, um, on that note, during your crafting experience, as you're working to try and survive, it's very likely that one of the cannibal people will attack you. <laughs> Hello. Whoa, bloody hell, Jesus Christ, I'm so... Whoa, okay. And the game gives you an option to create personal body armor, to at least provide a basic means of defense that isn't a short sleeve t-shirt and jeans. Your player character is able to fashion improvised armor from the resources in their infantry. Resources that they can readily harvest from the environment. And players of the forest have probably just smirked because they know where I'm going with this. See, to make armor, there's deer pelts from the native deer, and you can hunt them if you're quick and lucky with a bow and arrow. There's also lizard skin from a type of monitor lizard. There are monitor lizards for some reason. Oh, hello. Stand still and die like a lizard. Yeah, give me. You win this round. And the other two types? Well, I'm not going to talk about the last one. Not yet. Too early. But the third one, the one that you'll be making armor out of for much of the game, is, um, human bones. I see. Bone armor. Increased armor. Ah, okay. Can I make anything? Oh. Bandaging a few bones to your arm. Okay. Okay, um, again, I don't want to get sucked down into the muck of video game logic, but I feel I need to remind people that the main premise of the game is this guy has literally just crash landed. He's still in the Tom Hanks wearing the FedEx shirt throwing coconuts at a rock stage of his survival experience. And yet the game expects, nigh encourages, the player to cremate human bodies, collect their bones, and strap them to himself as body armor. I've been circling around this in my script. I've been tempted so many times to just cut this out because, like, this is me, right? I'm doing this. The game gives you options to make armor, and I'm choosing to do this, right? I'm choosing to use human bones. I'm just making a thing of this for my script. But, okay, three things.
One, note that there is no form of armor that doesn't involve skinning or stripping the flesh off of something. Yeah. Two, the deer pelts don't actually function as armor anymore. They used to, but they took that out. So for protection, it's either cannibal parts or lizards. And three, lizards aren't available in the underground caves, which is where much of the game takes place. Which means, yeah, the game expects me to wear human remains for protection. And doesn't say anything on that? We have lost a bit of armor, so I'm just going to quickly grab some from my pre-prepared bone box. This will start a trend. We're going to circle back to this in what I'm going to call a neighborly stroll into unbelievable violence, where this guy, this protagonist, for seemingly no reason, with a multitude of far more sensible options, immediately goes for the most extremely violent one in a moment that just makes you go, huh? Skin rack? I beg your pardon? Skin rack? Bone chandeliers? What the fuck, dude? Fucking hell, this is really fu- What the fucking hell? End Knight, um, isn't this your first game? This is literally your first protagonist. Are you sure he's the protagonist? Oh, and what am I talking about when I say better options in this scenario? Well, I mean, think about it. We're trying to make body armor, hmm? For protection against the cannibal people who come charging out of the forest? If only we had, like, oh, I, I don't know, some sort of access to a large amount of metal? Maybe aluminium and steel? Materials designed to be lightweight yet flexible? If only we had some sort of implement that might allow us to shear off strips of it, to fashion it into some sort of personal armor. No, we're going with bones. <laughs> you, human bones. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why am I using their bones to make armor? I genuinely have no idea. There's some perfectly good metal from the plane that this guy can scavenge to make armor. I think he's just a fucking nutcase. Exploring the area reveals that the forest is mostly flat with a large river running through it, hemmed in by oceans on all sides. With the exception of the north, which has a large mountain range blocking your path, the search and rescue operations are going to have to come by the sea or the air. Good job that we found the yacht at least. There might just be our ticket out of this place when we find Timmy. The plane passengers are far from the only people who have ever come to this place. There are campsites, both large and small, some expensive looking equipment, and specialist cave diving gear, such as ropes and steel anchors which are biting into the rock, leading down into the cave entrances. Who set up these camping tents? Who set up all of these ropes that lead into the caves? There are far older things too. Old looking tents and army beds, old wooden boats and hunting perches. Who bought the rowboats here? And there are even numerous thatched huts and small villages that look like they've been attacked. Who set up all of these thatched tents? The cannibals? Also, I'm not kidding about how expensive some of this stuff looks. You end up finding not only scores of laptops and other electronics, but what looks like state-of-the-art underwater drones. Most are still actually powered and left where they were deployed, along with a vast number of heavy-looking crates. There's numerous well-funded groups sending lots of very expensive hardware and specialists, all of whom look like they've been attacked by the cannibal people. So the obvious question that follows is, um... Why was there no major search for these people? Yeah, I'm wondering, wondering why no one's come for the surveyors. You think if they all went missing, they'd send someone? The weirdest one is probably one of the larger camps that appears to be a, a film crew. Not only with their expensive cameras, but with numerous tents that appear to have been savaged. Why was there no major search for these people? Like, they were sent. They didn't just randomly come down in a plane crash. They chartered, I assume, a boat? Which presumably would have come to pick them up? And when they didn't arrive? Many questions. Pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. It all adds to an enticing mystery. What the fuck is the forest? Whilst back at your camp, you're probably failing to hunt dinner. Come on. Damn it. Oh, hello. Ah, damn it. Oh, come on. Oh, come off it! What the? Ah! Moving target. Ah! Ah! <laughs> Fucking seagulls. You'll probably check your perimeter and find that you've had guests. Bone basket, arrow basket. Uh, do you mind? <coughs> Madam? I made that! Huh? Oh, she's got her tits yeah. out. 
and she's angry about it. And defending yourself from the intruders no doubt prompts you to craft weapons and quickly learn how to use them. And it's here that you discover that the cannibals are the major focus of the game. Whoa, hello. Like major focus. Yeah. The way they attack you, the way that they swarm in groups. Oh, look at that. I've never seen that before. The way they size you up from a distance before maybe one of them goes in to challenge you. It's pretty well done. Sometimes they even run away when things look a bit too dangerous. Last chance. Smart. It regularly brings up the same question in your head. Who are these cannibal people? Here they come. You will also start to notice leavings. Sticks and rocks combined with undoubtedly human remains done in such a way that's clearly meant to have meaning. You'll find severed heads with things stuffed in their mouths, rags tying their hair, or skulls stuffed inside... I'm not even sure. Is that meant to represent a womb? They clearly have an extremely complicated set of religious beliefs. Why are they constructing effigies? Before long, you'll start to find these effigies everywhere, everywhere the cannibals have been, perhaps marking territory or as a warning not to proceed. There are certain areas that seem special for unclear reasons. Watching the cannibals move around in the distance, you'll figure out that they congregate at specific sites, gigantic trees surrounded by these icons. Why are they putting these effigies around specific locations? Yeah, I wonder if perhaps they're, it's one of their religious sites? If you're particularly attentive, you might catch a glimpse of the cannibals making the effigies directly outside your camp. Oh, look, look, oh wow, one of them just set up one of the fetishes. I'd never seen them do that before, did you see that? Are they trying to curse you? Honour you? Warn others to stay away from you? Why are they building effigies outside my camp? Were all of these here before? Perhaps they're trying to curse me. But that's not the most interesting part. The most interesting part is that they like to incorporate outsider technology within the effigies. Pencils and pens, cameras and clothing, torches and watches, fingers dangling on these modern camping lines. Why incorporate modern technology within their effigies? It's interesting that they incorporate so many, you know, elements that they find. Like, it's a toothbrush there. Many questions. The cannibals clearly have a very elaborate set of cultural norms. And it looks like they might be different tribes? Some of them are distinctly different from each other. What the hell are they? Chains? Sooner or later though, your surface exploration is going to find a really big puzzle piece. Try building a birdhouse? Is that a thing? Whoa. Wow. Okay. It's not an impact crater. The earth is, isn't deformed the right way. It's a sinkhole? Is this made naturally, or is it part of a supernatural story? No, it's too small to be a mining operation. I'm guessing it is indeed a lava tube. Well, that would explain the tunnels. If this whole place, this whole island, is threaded with lava tubes all over the place that have since cooled and gone inactive, then yeah, this whole area could be completely honeycombed with tunnels. The cannibals wouldn't need to do any excavation at all. And just to add it in my script here, where it seems the most appropriate, you later learn that this sinkhole is really the focus of all cannibal activities. As in, so many caves lead back here. Why are the cannibals focused around the sinkhole? What on earth? Also of note, right at the bottom of the sinkhole... Yeah, we might have to pop back upstairs to just hunt something to eat. Oh, it's a helicopter! It's a crashed helicopter! How did that happen? At this point in the story, I had yet to learn about the cockpit surviving, and naturally I figured that I wanted to call for help, so... Wait, maybe there's a radio. How recent was... Uh, yeah, how recent was the crash? A giant sinkhole and a helicopter included. It's like a bullseye. An X marks the spot. So down into the tunnel network I went. Down here you'll find the cannibals, but it's a different character to what you'll see upstairs. I spoke before about the contrast between your home base and the open world. Oh dear! Well, down in the caves, that contrast is highlighted hugely. The game does a good job of it, I think. You feel pretty vulnerable. They'll be rushing at you through the darkness, resulting in close quarters brawls before they rush off again. You'll fumble through the network of tunnels in search of clues insofar as what happened to your son without really knowing what you're doing or where you're going. You'll find a trail. Children's drawings, seemingly made with crayons and positioned all over the place. They depict a range of things, mostly horrible. You assume that your son is drawing them, but, well... 
Who is making the drawings? The game draws attention to the fact that at least one other child has gone missing, and it won't be long until you discover newspaper clippings telling you of others. So, again... Why are children going missing? What has it got to do with this place? These items are scattered amongst a myriad of other things, some taken from the plane, but some clearly not. Suitcases are stacked up alongside random electronics, spelunking equipment, and really old things such as ancient wooden crates and cots. There are also some clever little technical details. The ropes are loading screens, as far as I can tell, as are the tight squeezes between the cave areas, seamlessly rendering the next segment without breaking your immersion. Also, if you're exploring the surface and you manage to get injured to the point of death, you're not actually forced to restart the game. You're shown a short cutscene in which you're captured and taken to a place on the map that becomes known as the Hanging Cave. It's over here on the map. It's just another place you can explore normally, but it's also at that location where you find a dead body of a surveyor? And he has a map. The same map that you'll use for the rest of the game. Meaning if you've not found it yet, you'll find it here. Where am I on the map though so that I know... Reminds me of the morning. It's in the hanging cave that you'll also find some grisly scenes. The hell are they? Ugh. Are they meant to be babies? And as you're on your way out, you may find that something lunges at you. Oh, there is a way up. Hang on. Up, 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 up. You can bog off. Oh my god, on toast. Nope, 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 nope. The caves are just full of death. You start finding the plane passengers, what's left of them anyway. Their insides are no longer that. And in some cases, it appears that the cannibals are... Uh, disassembling people? There are piles of specific organs such as hearts in one cave, arms in another, fingers hanging from string in several. Like spare parts, almost. Like someone making piles of scrap metal. Why are the cannibals organising body parts into piles? And they keep sorting things into piles, don't they? Piles of money, piles of watches, piles of heads, piles of legs. They're very neat. The finger thing is actually notable, much more so than the other organs. There are these displays of severed fingers that you need to walk under, all tied with modern line. The developers seem to be drawing specific attention to it. It's all at your eye level. Something to do with fingers. Why are the cannibals preoccupied with fingers? They keep hanging fingers all over the place. In fact, it's almost as if each individual cave has a bit of a theme, doesn't it? It's here, though, that I want to take another quick tangent. Just like the thing about the weird logic. Because I started to notice something else. Every time I'd see something done well, done really well, in fact, it was almost immediately followed by something done very poorly. My expectations would rise on seeing something cool, but then sink again when I would spot a major problem with it. Yeah, the pathfinding is pretty goofy, isn't it? Come on. The game has subtle attention to detail in places, notably with audio. The cave networks are just full of ambience. The sound of blood dripping from the hanging corpses, or things breathing quietly just ahead of you in the gloom. I hear something. Breathing. Or the interface audio echoing from the walls of large open spaces like the sinkhole. <laughs> The sound of me upgrading something just echoed off the walls. So that's cool, but then they made no attempt to balance the audio. Is that too loud? That looks too loud. Shall I turn that down for you? Sorry. Can we get through here? It's a bit loud. Sorry, that's way too loud. Holy shit. I don't know why that's so loud. Sorry. Sorry. That's so loud. Where does this go? Oh, Jesus Christ. Ow, that's loud. Thank you, game. The cave system features diving, in which you have to submerge into this murky, ominous-looking water. It can become some of the game's most chilling moments. A whole load of corpses down here. Careful. Don't get stuck. Just stay calm. But then, they didn't actually put in an underwater floor texture. They've just duplicated the surface texture, which has really obviously reflecting puddles. Yeah, that's not good. The game has spent time creating this lavish crafting screen, at least twice, as far as I can tell, where you place items in the middle and then you modify them, but... Uh, damag. Front and centre, damag. Speed, damag or block. 
They've taken care to place down items and then control where you find them, but seemingly nobody put in a system to not duplicate the items when an area loads. So backtracking through a tunnel, which will happen a lot, has you stumble upon stuff you've already found. Didn't I break these? Which, you know, you might not care about for most items. Ah, respawning petrol. But like, Timmy has a toy robot. It was shown to us in the plane. What's that, sorry? But you'll stumble upon the same toy pieces. What's this? Oh, is it another piece of Timmy's toy? Again. What's this? Oh, it's another piece of Timmy's toy. And again. Oh, look. Really? Another piece of Timmy's toy? And again. Simple bugs that really should have been sorted out. Look, I'm just picking up the same piece of toy again and again. That, that's a little immersion breaking. Oh, and here's one. They thought about how the players would illuminate their way through the cave network. They give the player a little plastic lighter by default, and that of course can be followed by flares and then the ability to illuminate your own weapon. But for some reason, they've made it so that the system switches off your source of light if you perform an action. Just swinging it once makes it go out? Like opening the crafting book. Ah, damn. Or transitioning through one of the many cave entrances. That's a little annoying, to be honest. Or like picking something up. See, see what I mean? As in, like the moment you interact with anything, you put out the source of light? The whole playthrough, it's aggravating. Nobody thought to just reactivate the light source when the player has stopped an action? Nobody in the dev team thought that. Ah, flares. Damn. Did I really lose that? Oh, that's stupid. I'm trying to emphasize that when you make software, testing is everything. I know that sounds self-serving from someone with a background in QA, but if you'll forgive my admittedly very biased take, I'm saying that when working in a software team, we can design the most creative feature set imaginable, we can code the most incredible system of systems, but at the end of the process, if it doesn't actually function, if it doesn't work properly in the hands of the customer, then what the fuck are we doing? Doubly so if our team plans to make follow-up products based on our reputation. People aren't stupid. If your first product launch was jank, they're not going to rush out to pay full price for the second. Essentially, this is me talking to future creators. Never half ass quality. Take the time to get it right. No customer in your final 1.0 product launch should ever see something like this. Oh, is she okay? Yeah. I almost don't want to interrupt. It's like, it seems like a very private ritual she's got going on here. She'll get tired eventually. You have a good day, Mom. Probably more importantly, what I'm trying to set up with this tangent is playing the forest is uniquely inconsistent. That my personal experience of playing was to find something interesting only for it to be followed by a drop. That there is this strange oscillating quality problem that comes into play. For now though, Back to the plot. As you continue to explore, you'll start to build up more questions insofar as what's going on here, with each cave dive usually followed by a return to the surface to resupply. It's clear that Timmy, or at the very least a child making drawings, is being kept alive. And is being shown around? He's swimming wearing scuba gear? The pictures are in strange positions, some on the surface in front of the sinkhole and some in the caves themselves. And while it's not clear if the cannibals are moving the pictures after the fact, Timmy has had time to draw them. Why are they giving him such a tour? Why not just eat him? Okay, that's a creepy drawing. That's a really creepy drawing. Sooner or later though, your trips to and from the caves will have you bump into something quite different, triggering a flurry of questions insofar as what exactly this strange place is. Whoa, it's one of those creatures. Uh-oh. Looks like four legs that have been merged together with something. Let's kill it when it's in the open. Threading this thing with arrows, it just doesn't want to go down. If you encounter one of these in the tunnels, it actually hits like a freight train, rearing up onto its hind legs and charging at you, hissing and screaming, trying to tear you limb from limb as it's trying now. But eventually, with enough arrows, this twisted monster goes down. Yuck. Fucking hell, look at it. What made this? Was this joined? 
was it born? How long have these things been here? You know, it's a bit of a pity that they don't have a voice protagonist. It would have been really fascinating to hear them express themselves the first time you see this thing. I have no doubt they'd be in shock. The character would be struggling to hold onto their stomach on seeing such a sight. Such a twisted mockery of flesh. A perverted, deformed, unnatural thing that can only be the work of the most unspeakable... What am I doing? Oh god, what am I doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What did I do? What did you just do? What did you just do? What the fuck is that? Um... Creepy armor? End night? Why would you wear that? Are you guys okay? Why does this guy consider that normal? Do you have some issues that you guys want to like discuss over coffee? You have a protagonist who crashes in a plane, seems to be like a Bear Grylls TV personality type, wears human bones as armor, has no interest in calling for help, does um this. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus fucking Christ! And when they encounter one of these entities, an entity that must be pretty fucking horrifying, something straight out of John Carpenter's The Thing, and is probably supposed to provoke a flurry of serious questions insofar as what the fuck is happening, and the action that you guys put into the game, the only action that you can perform, is to, um, remove their hardened flesh, and then slide it onto your body as skin armor. Okay, I'm, sc I'm more scared of the protagonist than I am that thing. No, I stand corrected. That's not the only thing you can have the players do. You can- Ooh. What am I doing? What am I doing? Why? Why? Why does this guy think that's okay? That's a thing. That's the- that's the thing that's in the book. <laughs> okay, so that comes out of left field. Oh, you thirsty bitch? So much of this game comes out of left field. I'm gonna take this motherfucker. Give me the shoe, bitch. <laughs> Can you perhaps see why I wanted to make this huge ass video? More so than other games I've played, the design decisions are very unexpected. And to follow this, these giant leggy creatures have another twisted thing about them. They create smaller mutant babies. The same babies that you saw in the hanging cave. And I think this is meant to be horrifying, but um... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Was that supposed to be scary? Oh, Jesus! <laughs> That's ridiculous. Head crab babies. Anyway. <laughs>
There are certain items that I think it would be a good idea for the player to have early, such as a camcorder so you can play the tapes that you can find, but yeah, okay, okay. The other questions. Are they directing the players in specific ways with diegetic reasons for the player to be moving in one particular direction? And the answer here is no, actually, never. And the forest is really hurt for it. Subnautica's distress beacons were used as a way to get the player moving in a direction they may not have been, towards a biome that they might not have realized existed, yet the forest has no equivalent. Does that matter normally in an open world game? No, not really. It's normally just a survival canvas for you not to die on. But when you add a story, particularly a mystery story, it kind of does. As in, you want the player to have all the clues. Some of these cave entrances are so well concealed, they feel more like Easter eggs. There's a cave entrance in this picture. Can you spot it? It's here, under the fucking ocean. Yeah, it, it's fucked, isn't it? How could the player possibly know that? Weirdly, it's a problem with an easily identifiable solution. You continually trip over the exploration efforts of other people, and the map you have is one you found on the body of another. Just put in map notes showing caves you haven't been to yet, that this surveyor has a marker saying that there's a site there or whatever. The game used to have little paper maps that you could find, annotated ones, but there's nothing like that in the game now. And lastly, I said that Subnautica's plot felt like it took place in areas that were a bit detached from the environment, not well worked in. Well, um, we'll get there with the forest. For now, as a player, you continue your routine. You find upgrades for your person, better climbing gear, underwater breathing equipment, better weapons, better tools. Alas though, to mention it once more, you can't help but encounter the bizarre quality seesaw again. The cannibal people are the focus, the overwhelming focus, and when they're working perfectly, they become a chilling enemy. So what happens, do you reckon there's three of them this time? They're trying to get through the walls. But for every cool moment that you see, there's another encounter that just kicks your immersion in the head, such as when they teleport in in front of you, or continually get stuck, or just run in circles as the pathfinding just glitches out. Whoop. They want a fun run. What's... You two playing Kiss Chase? What the fuck are you doing? The horror elements, especially the gore, are really hyped up in places. Some of the visuals are strong, like really strong. Fucking hell, that's strong. They cut this dude in half. But it goes from 0 to 60 so early and so often that it numbs you to all the shock, which means that the later moments, which are presumably meant to stay lodged in your mind, simply don't. I think the best example is this cave. It literally has a floor of dead babies. Yep, that's, um, that's a dead baby carpet. But remember, that's the hanging cave. That's where you're taken if you get knocked out at first. Not much is going to phase you horror-wise if your first game over screen has you walk over a carpet of dead babies. You know? Grim. The game has a myriad of animals to identify as you explore around, and you can hunt many of them in order to survive. They collectively make the world feel more vibrant and alive. Jesus, what the fuck is that? You're a crocodile! But, um, well, uh, okay. <laughs> this dude does not give a fuck. My god, you look terrible as a model, as a game model. Look at that. It's awful. Okay. Previously on X Men. Oh, and this is one of the weird ones. The developers made it so that in order to save the game, you need to sleep. That's why you build a shelter. But what happens if you need to save the game underground, far from your base? No problem, the developers thought. We'll just put in camping tents underground, the ones the cave explorers use. Job done. But really, they didn't interrogate this for even a moment, because some of the tents are in ludicrously impractical areas, sometimes on the other side of long and perilous underwater sections with only one way in or out. How on earth did the tent get in there? 
The most bizarre tent is where you're able to find the bow upgrade. It's in a dead end cave in literally one of the deepest areas in the map, being hundreds of meters down through solid rock next to a stack of boxes and delicate cardboard. You had to swim more than a hundred meters through an extremely perilous route and the game is saying that someone did that with all of this gear, boxes that will not tolerate water immersion and also a bow underground. Oh and an underwater drone. <laughs> It doesn't make any sense. It, it doesn't make any fucking sense. You might think I'm nitpicking, but again, this is a mystery game. Customers will be paying attention to the little details because they're expecting to be fed clues as part of the mystery. And then they find things that even on a surface level inspection reveals not just bugs, not just technical implementation being a bit wonky, uh, what the fuck? But stuff that doesn't make any fucking sense. This is why it's so important to play test. You bring in people that are new to spot the stuff that you're used to. Again, testing, testing, testing. It really is absolutely paramount. Ah, oh, damn it, Forrest. Can you stop doing this? It keeps having moments of cool, like it, uh, moments that are inspired, and then it's immediately undercut, undercut moments later by some cannibal glitching into a tree. So the cannibals seem to have very elaborate rituals when it comes to their effigies. They build these things as displays, sometimes complicated displays, for reasons unknown. But your journey down into the cave network will soon find something on another level entirely. Going into one of the caves, you'll find the remains of three people sitting around a campfire. But the scene here is extraordinary. What's this? There are bottles of alcohol everywhere, cash and watches in boxes and briefcases, modern laptops positioned as though in use. One of the men lies flat on a table as though he's being operated on, while another one is impaled, his guts being emptied into a suitcase. And crouched down is another man with a Japanese sword thrust deep into his chest. The man with the sword in him appears to have a large back tattoo held aloft by sticks and pinned in place, up above and behind him like a bad that is a sashimono. The banners famously worn on the backs of soldiers in feudal Japan to indicate loyalty in battle. How the hell do cannibal people know about the samurai? They were attacked and then their camp was staged like this. Why are they posed like this? It is extremely distinctive and eye-catching. A group of cannibals spent a lot of time putting this together, perhaps with a katana meant to imitate seppuku. Are the cannibals copying this from some art that they found? Are they mocking it? Are they paying tribute to it? The questions pour in. This here means there's more to the cannibals than it seems. Jesus Christ, look. Smugglers, maybe. And then, in another cave, some of the bodies are not merely mutilated, but they've been cut completely in half, like extremely cleanly. I don't know what's going on there. And they haven't been torn either, they've been cut. Horizontally and vertically, the cannibals have access to some sort of sharp tool. Why are they slicing people in half? Fuck me, that's dark. The tool of this artist is soon revealed. Whoa. A chainsaw. Okay, well, I've discovered the mystery of the blade weapon, everybody. A modern chainsaw, complete with jerry cans of fuel. Again, is this mockery? Are they paying tribute? None of this is simply storing food or removing threats. They're making displays, elaborate displays. But why? But again, we still haven't discovered why the cannibals are doing this. They've clearly got some extremely elaborate rituals that they perform. They're not just doing it for the funsies. Maybe this guy is. So there's way more going on with the cannibals than it originally seems. They knew how to use a chainsaw. They're not as stupid as they seem. As you continue from cave to cave, you'll find more stacks of organs, stacks of limbs, stacks of boxes, stacks of flotation devices, stacks of aircraft food. All of this looks like part of a pattern, a bizarre internal language that you cannot yet understand. You'll find several rooms with skulls. Piles of skulls, all with the skin removed, all still bloodied. Why are there piles of skulls? Another slight tangent. Beware of scale. There's a film made in 2020 called Underwater. It stars the actress Kristen Stewart and is a science fiction film that involves the crew of a deep water mining facility off the coast of Japan. I'm going to do some major spoilers, so I'll put a timestamp on the screen if you want to skip ahead. 
For reasons that are implied, but I don't think directly stated by the story, the whole drilling operation takes place on the sea floor of the Mariana Trench, leading to an extreme ocean depth of 11 kilometers due to subduction. For context, most of the ocean is about 3.7 kilometers deep. It's so deep, in fact, that you could stick all of Mount Everest in the Mariana Trench, and you'd still have to dive down 2 kilometers to even notice. In the film, an unknown event occurs, in which the facility is badly damaged by some sort of quake, and the surviving crew members must attempt to get to the surface, but they're thwarted by mysterious creatures that stalk them throughout the drilling facility, picking them off one by one. The film? It's, um... It's okay. It's a claustrophobic sci-fi horror with a non-human creature that stalks the characters through an industrial looking setting. If you've seen Alien, you've seen most of this. And the plot itself dabbles with the superficial veneer of Lovecraftian horror, of there being powerful unknown things in the deep places of the earth that defy human measurement, let alone understanding. But at the same time, the film seems to have decided that after principal photography? Literally adding Cthulhu after the fact. And then it has Kristen Stewart make a dumb one-liner before blowing it up with a bomb. Three, two, one. So let's light this shit up. Yeah, it's not great. And it certainly doesn't understand why Lovecraftian stuff is so interesting. But I'm getting distracted. My point. The main setup for the story is that there is a large corporation mining the Mariana Trench. And while, yes, this is the future, and they clearly have near-future technologies, we, the audience, know what a corporation is. And, well... The film gives these huge sweeping shots of this absolutely gargantuan facility. Deck after deck made of presumably steel, plastics, reinforced glass, rubber, titanium, and is that concrete? Expansive living quarters and command areas for more than 300 people. Vast drilling facilities with at least two massive and powerful nuclear reactors. This facility here? This isn't even the drill facility. This is like the residential hab. One small part part of this fictional corporation's cash investment. And it's hard to tell, but I think the command facility is being held aloft by this skyhook thing. About the same diameter as the station? Does that go 11 kilometers up? Basically, this is so much mass being built that far down. In the stage from the written word to CGI, presumably in pursuit of the rule of cool, the concept has been scaled up so much that I simply don't buy it. No corporation would spend that much money to put all of this down here. They'd make a drill site with a bunch of really cramped quarters, minimizing the air volume that they'd have to keep down there, and then just automate almost everything. Instead, the film shows that they've built these huge corridors so long that you can have these tense will they make it before the water gets in chase sequences. The film wants to say that this environment is super challenging, that this is one of the most dangerous places on Earth, and yet they've built all of this at a ludicrously unnecessary level of expense and levels of additional complexity and opportunities for failure. It's scale. The problem is scale. Someone had an idea that the characters are drilling in one of the most challenging environments known to man, but then the people deciding how that would look ignored the limitations of that idea. The scale doesn't fit the premise. Another example, a game called Valley from 2016. The player, an extreme tourist type, explores a remote mountainous region of America. Ah, the loud, my ears! Holy <laughs> shit! Thank you, Blue Isle Studio, for deafening me. Thank you very much. Only to stumble upon an ancient and long decaying World War II research facility, a competitor to the Manhattan Project, secretly researching a weapon of mass destruction to help end World War II. Based on excavating some ruins, which are rumored to be sitting on some ancient, powerful artifact thing. I was enlisted by the army to study the history of this valley. Just past the ruins where the life seed, rumored to possess an earth-shattering power, was found. That's the premise. And whilst the setting is decidedly supernatural, with there being some mysterious life energy in this remote valley that I totally didn't abuse for the giggles. I take life. I give life. I take life. I give life. I take your life. The developers maybe went a bit too far with the scale. 
There are these gigantic ruins, all made from carved stone, along with colossal statues that are seemingly partially buried. Millions of metric tons of solid rock, cut, shaped, and moved in an area that, weirdly, the game twice acknowledges as having very poor soil quality, limiting the number of people that could have lived a sedentary lifestyle here. Whee! Oh god. Oh shit. did this civilization take hold so far north? The land here isn't arable, yet the population that lived here was clearly sedentary in nature. But like, also, I worry that sometimes I'm at risk of overanalyzing the metaphorical, or being that guy who accepts some magical MacGuffin, but not others. But in my brain, I can't help it. As I'm playing, I'm like... This was thousands of years ago, back when the vast majority of people, magic nature spirits be damned, had to spend most of their time just making food. The only reason Egypt got away with their big projects was because the Nile floods predictably, producing exceptionally fertile soil, allowing for 1.5 million people to live in one place without immediately starving to death. But here, in this valley, you tour vast granite and limestone ruins, stone-hewn pathways up mountains, colossal archways also up those mountains, and each brick has to be several metric tons apiece. And beneath that mountain, accessible right from the summit, a deep winding tunnel that the game specifically identifies as being here before the army arrived. So it was dug by the ancient natives. And, you know, assuming they were human, there's so much rock moved, it seems almost impossible. Just doing some quick napkin calculations. Look at this main tunnel, assumed to be the pathway to some sort of holy site, and later taken over by the army. You run down it as part of this really cool platformer section, and if we assume the player is moving at about 60 miles per hour, you run for about 190 seconds. That's a total length of 5,096.26 meters, so just over five kilometers corkscrewing down. Now let's assume the tunnel cut through the rock is about 15 meters wide and 40 meters tall on average. And then let's deduct these huge cavernous areas as almost certainly being of natural origin. And let's also be generous and ignore this really expansive bit at the end of the tunnel with this gigantic vaulted ceiling. And let's also ignore the effort taken to build the presumably now rotted bridges over the chasms and all the effort it would have taken to carve these gigantic faces into the rock, assuming that those are statues and they're not magically cursed giants or whatever. That's about 2.69 metric tons per cubic meter for an approximate 8,225,363.64 metric tons of granite hauled uphill anywhere between 1 to 5 kilometers to the top of the mountain and then down again, I assume as raw material for their buildings. For context, the Great Pyramid of Giza, the largest Egyptian pyramid, is about 5.9 million metric tons. This one tunnel, ignoring everything else built here, is a Great Pyramid and then some. The land here isn't arable. The land here isn't arable. Oh, and on the US Army, their complex is absolutely massive, consisting of two expansive, mostly steel, built facilities which are producing the bombs, built by US Army engineers over the course of just six years. When remember, this is a project that's meant to be competing with the Manhattan Project for wartime government spending, along with every other war department in the entire nation, such as the Army and the Navy. The science team here even had enough money to build a giant death ray on a mountain. It's it's too big. It's all too big. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I just don't buy it. It's way too big for the premise. It is cool, it is undeniably cool, but it's kicking my immersion in the head. It's a really amazing game though, seriously. If you're into Portal, you'll, you'll like this. Certainly pick it up on Steam, it's a proper gem. A quicker example next. The John Wick films involve a secret underworld of assassins, a very stylish concept, but over the course of the series they just couldn't keep a lid on the size of that underworld, to the point that you would never be able to keep it a secret. This expansive network of criminals? In a world where everyone has a camera in their pockets? Yeah, not for a moment. 
Or fuck, um, Doctor Who, a story about a cheeky, confident, wandering alien who stole a time machine and then ran off for episodic adventures. But then the newer writers started messing with the scale of the premise, to the point that the character is now the most important individual in the history of the fucking universe, and the major source of power for the most powerful alien race to have ever lived. The point that I'm trying to make is that within every piece of fiction, you can take its premise or its components and mess with their properties, mess with the scale, stretching it or shrinking it. The prior films had Death Stars? Well, our film is going to have a really big Death Star. But there will almost always come a point where the idea gets too big that it doesn't work anymore. Doubly so if the events of the story are supposed to be taking place in secret. Oh no wait, that's actually not going to work in our film. The antagonist isn't a big player, economically speaking. Their resources are actually very limited. Also, amazingly their economy is in such a sorry state that apparently they're melting coins. Do you have any idea how dirt poor a state has to be so that melting coins is worth their time? This plot device is too large to fit within our central premise. The audience is never going to buy it. So, how is any of that relevant to the forest? Well, um, how many skulls do you think are in that pile? There's probably, what, 80, 100 maybe, of probably freshly killed people? I mean, the developers probably added it because it's quite striking to look at. And it's just this one pile, right? I mean, oh. 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 There are so many piles, hundreds of skulls, thousands of skulls, each one belonging to somebody who has died, I assume relatively recently. There are dried, non-bloodied skulls all over this peninsula. So like, holy shit? How the fuck has any of this remained undetected? In a land where surveyors with expensive recording equipment are regularly visiting, and close enough to civilization that civilian air traffic is visible, and where the area is even mentioned in popular cave diving magazines, sending international tourists here, whose colleagues back home aren't going to go, well fuck it, Craig disappeared on his two weeks holiday, let's not follow that up, and the effigies have their own skulls as well, and the underwater areas are stuffed with bodies who still have their heads, and also don't really look like the cannibal people. So more unidentified dead people separate from these skull piles. Thousands and thousands of people. So many skulls. Hundreds if not thousands of corpses. What, the North Sentinel Islanders killed two fishermen and one moron preacher? And the news of that is everywhere. But the forest wants to say that thousands upon thousands of people are getting chopped up here, perhaps even hundreds being foreign citizens, and nobody knows about it or is doing anything. There's no way something like this would carry on for so long. Especially if, especially if there are surveyors here and stuff. So speaking very generally, as advice for those who will one day go on to create their own fiction, always consider what you add in the context of your central premise. That is the framework that your audience is consuming the material within. Just because you can write something big and cool, doesn't mean that you should. Or at least not without potentially damaging the work's believability in many circumstances. Don't blow things out of proportion, don't have a hard-on for what seems epic, there are limits to what an audience can buy. Beware of scale. Wait, what was, what was on that cassette? Combine. Equip. Is this what the kids listen to these days? Hey guys, look at this. I'm listening to this like... Don't know what this is. Yeah. Oh, okay. He didn't, he really didn't like it. stream. Now, I would like to spend the next four and a half hours talking about the DayZ mod. The DayZ mod places players in the fiction. Cannibals, corpses, and mutants, oh my. You actually encounter quite a few of these horrors underground. Not that I was ever taken aback by this, as I eloquently narrated my live stream adventure. Whoa, holy shit, what the fuck is that? You can piss off, you can piss off. I don't want to be in this cave anymore. Whoa, whoa. Ah, fucking hell, fucking hell. He's down, he's down. What the fuck is this thing? I don't think all of these limbs are human. 
With the number of extra limbs that these things have, I was starting to suspect that maybe we had like a Dr. Moreau type situation. That perhaps these additional limbs are indeed spare parts. Maybe the cannibals have found a way to combine people somehow, via some crude vivisection. Is that what all of this cannibal behaviour is going to end up meaning? Are these adornments that they have merely the trainees? What the fuck is this thing? Before long, you'll encounter one of the wooden plank walls that Timmy drew, studded with crucifixes. Perhaps trying to keep something inside? They seem pretty fragile too. A few brief swings, ear-splittingly loud audio notwithstanding, and you're through. Even the cannibals don't appear to have much problem smashing them down. I don't think they made these. Who built these wooden walls? The potential answer appears to be behind one of them. What's this? Oh. Huh. And it doesn't stop there. In short order, you'll start to find Bibles. A lot of Bibles. They're everywhere. Not lots of Bibles, crates of Bibles. There's at least two separate Bibles that the game holds up to your face to look at. Why such strong emphasis on the Bible? What's with the Bibles? And once you realise that, you start to notice them all over the place. In the yacht, back where we first arrived, for example, there are literally stacks of Bibles, along with Christian iconography that's used as set dressing. Why so many Bibles and crucifixes? The discovery of some older bodies, seemingly spared the teeth of the cannibal people, might offer some clue. One of them has a charcoal drawing of the sinkhole, and there is Latin text written on it, implying missionaries, maybe, from centuries ago. It's the picture of a sinkhole, it's a drawing of the sinkhole. Corpse beheaded. Tantalizingly, our mysterious missionaries have something else in their possession. Is that a flare or dynamite? It's dynamite, holy shit. Quite a lot of dynamite. Why do the missionaries have dynamite? In terms of the gameplay, you can break open the crates and use the dynamite to make shortcuts between the caves. But from a narrative perspective, this is a strange thing for them to have. And that one body that I showed you? He's got whole crates of dynamite. Notable because look at this cave here. It looks almost blasted through. And it's overlooking the sinkhole directly. With a whole load of dynamite, some of which is already open. Were they trying to blow up the sinkhole? Why is there dynamite in the walls around the sinkhole? There's some threat down there, isn't there? Some sort of danger that these men of God saw fit to give their lives trying to bury. And they failed, didn't they? And then in the next cave, we have this. Why did they do it like that? Strictly speaking, it's one of the plain passengers. He's not been crucified, but merely posed to look like he was. And beneath him, three suitcases. Three offerings? Again, reverence? Mockery? What does it mean? Did the missionaries actually succeed in converting these cannibals, but they're twisting it into their own perverted version of Christianity? Said speculation is only deepened when you spend more time with the surface cannibals, for their own modifications can be incredibly eye-catching. Elaborate backpacks that are made out of human arms, torches that have been built into skulls strapped above their heads, and some of them would even come at you with faces that are not their own, as though they're trying to become, I think, the plane passengers, by literally wearing their faces like masks. Why are they modifying themselves like that? Holy shit. And I feel the need to emphasize, I'm not just describing different mobs, like different combat classes. I'm not mixing up what is clearly a mechanical consideration and confusing it with plot. The cannibals, with a few notable exceptions, do exactly the same thing. They fight in melee. So the game developers have seemingly spent quite a lot of time carefully designing extremely distinct looking tribes in a way that suggests that they really want you to notice. And certainly the one that you'll notice the most are the cross cannibals. What the fuck? What the fuck is he? What the fuck was he? Crosses? He's covered himself in crosses. This one too. Look. Why are these ones covered in crosses? They've tattooed it on themselves. Okay, so Christian iconography has to have something to do with this place. Holy shit. These people are tattooing themselves with crucifixes. What do they know that I don't yet? And by extension, why are they pulling all this stuff underground? Are these, in reality, offerings? 
is this some sort of cargo cult thing? The cannibals having been taught Christianity, but are horribly misunderstanding it. And also, some of the cannibals seem really sickly. She's more fucked up than most of the other ones. Malnourished and emaciated, as though going through a famine, they laugh and charge in violently, with little thought for self-preservation. The community have appeared to dub them skinnies, and they also seem to rush to a recently slain ally and feast upon their raw flesh as though they're starving to death, despite the peninsula being full of things they would otherwise eat. If this isn't starvation, then... What's wrong with some of these people? What made them look like that? And by extension, what makes them so absurdly, outrageously violent? At the same time though, I feel I'm one to talk because, um, hmm. No phones. Just people living in the moment. Hi, I need your bones. Come back. Don't hurt my armor. It took a while to make. And you'll be part of it soon. One more for the pile. I skin you, I skin you, I skin you. The first person that I murdered into a fire to get their bones, which I am now wearing. Again, everything I'm saying is underlined with the hypocrisy of the fact that I'm using their bones as building material. Look, 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 I've been stuck in this forest for about 30 days, okay? The length of time it takes to make most of one bullshittery. Yeah, the developers of this game really do expect you to go 0 to 60. If anything, it becomes this hilarious routine where some of them go to your base and they attack it, and then before you know it, you have some new furniture. The book even has this diegetic list of, like, displays that you can make when your sanity bar drops even slightly? And the things that you can do with the parts you can take off the enemy? Okay, I, I didn't make these, but you know, a short trip into Google Images later. At this point, I'm rather glad that Tom Hanks didn't have any natives with him on that island. That Wilson scene would have hit very different. I'm sorry, Wilson! Wilson, I'm sorry! I'm sorry! Wilson! As with a great many games, with a little bit of time, you're able to get over the jank and start to familiarise yourself with the mechanics. I'd personally say that survival games are kind of unique, because the unfamiliarity you have with the mechanics is normally a major part of the mouthfeel, the struggle to survive, that sort of thing. But gradually, as you get better at the gameplay, it will begin to express itself as competence in combat. And frankly, after a short few hours, you'll start to feel like a bit of a badass. Don't be rude. What have you learnt? Wanna try your luck? I just killed two birds with one stone. Someone should come up with a saying for that. Is he your boyfriend? Hmm? Not anymore. My next step, it's a doozy. Two for one. She's upset. So was she? Wrong arrow. Ooh, nice dodge. <laughs> dodge that. But bear in mind, however, that no matter how experienced you feel, you're still gonna get smacked in the face by a flying baby. <laughs> Ouch! Fucking flying babies! You'll also find what appears to be a restraining order from somebody called Jessica Cross towards someone called Matthew Cross. Apparently Matthew Cross was becoming violent. A brief look at the passenger manifest shows that no one was called Cross on that plane. The occupants of the yacht, and maybe that grave. And this is when the plot dips into the unexpected, because near that cave... What is this? Was this carved? What's this metal? Strange. It's a panel cast from some sort of metal. It's far too large and heavy to be anything the cannibals could have moved. It's either been ripped entirely off whatever it was mounted on, or crushed down in some sort of cave-in. What it is exactly remains unknown until you explore further and discover this. What the fuck? Intriguing indeed. 
The plot of the game quickly thickens with the presence of our heavyweight friend here, built into the rock and closed like the jaws of an ancient monster. What the fuck? And I've no doubt, as many live streamers reach this point, an opportunity to fervently articulate one's thoughts and feelings to their collective audiences, to express their surprise and exhilaration at the story twists unfolding, in a manner that is no doubt both eloquent, thought-provoking, and verbose. What the fuck? There are mysterious mechanisms placed nearby that seem to want something. Huh? Oh. And it won't be long before you notice that maybe the rocks aren't the thing the door is looking for. And it isn't mentioned anywhere in the game, but in the wiki, these doors are specifically referred to as the sacrifice doors. No need to say the obvious, but the cannibals didn't make this. And now, with the disassembled body parts, some of those puzzle pieces in your brain may start to line up. The cannibal behaviour is being influenced by something yet unknown, isn't it? Perhaps something through these doors. And a journey through one of them brings you to a scene that presumably has been sealed away for centuries. What the fuck? Okay, this isn't good. Covering their eyes. Begging? Praying? They all died here. They weren't- these people weren't posed, were they? No sign of any effigies or weapons or tribal affiliation. These people weren't cannibals, were they? These were the missionaries. Why are the corpses frozen like that? Look at them. Their soft tissue has been dried. It's almost as if they've had all the moisture pulled from them. Their skeletons are still in one piece. A black cross? Is it meant to be a cross? Why did they all die facing that black marker on the wall? They placed the crosses here to contain it? Maybe? We've seen that shape before. There was a picture on the yacht, though with more detail. At the time, I didn't recognize it as anything significant. What the fuck is that thing? Whatever it is, it comes across as evil, and is probably the centerpiece of everything that's happening here. Similarly, in another cave, you'll stumble upon another revelation. Paint. Normal red paint. The exact same shade which coats the man in red. You perhaps wonder if he's not all he appears to be. There are scribbled notes raving in English. She's not dead, she's sleeping. So the red man can speak English? What do these messages mean? Is the paint meant to seem like blood to the tribals? Have we perhaps met our Dr. Moreau? And upon the wall, a tall red man standing before smaller figures. Why was this painted on the wall? The presence of the paint tin implies this was done recently, but by whom isn't quite clear. The red figure towers over the rest as if to imply dominance. Perhaps the cannibals have some sort of prophecy. They seem to be venerating a figure in red. Is he taking advantage of their elaborate customs to assert himself at the top of their grisly food chain? Fuck, there's quite a few of them. Well, I see the quite a few of you, and I light this pile of leaves. Fear me, cannibals of the forest. I can't see. So by this point in the story, we have lots of questions, lots of clues, and for some, a picture may be starting to appear in their mind. A picture of something unknown beneath this forest that's causing cannibals to revere it, and missionaries to fear it, and somehow it's related to a bunch of missing children. But once again, to talk about that quality seesaw problem, why was I talking about that? I mean, bugs are bugs, right? Who cares? Well, as I said, this game experience is constantly up and down. You'll see something cool and have like a cool fight or something. Disgusting creature. Only for it to be potentially ruined by poor execution, or there's something that ruins your immersion. Pathfinding, not good. And as I keep saying, this is a mystery plot. As a result, people are paying a little bit more attention than they would be otherwise. Those two elements combined causes a bit of a unique problem in these circumstances. The level of quality can sometimes dip low. So low, in fact, that you start to become unsure of exactly what is and isn't a clue. What you're meant to notice and what's just part of this weird dip where just not enough thought went into it. So like, the katana men. 
That could only be a clue. How could it not? As in, the developers clearly want you to see it. It's literally the only thing in the cave, save for a small cubby with some skulls in it. It's really well telegraphed as something you should notice, but in plenty of places you'll walk past something and do a double take and go, wait. For example, the sharks. Is that a story clue? Why the dead sharks? What's happened here then? Great white sharks are apex predators with an extremely vast hunting range. The 1996 film The Craft even used beached sharks as visual shorthand for something supernatural when the main characters dabble with dark magic one evening. These are my gifts! <sighs> so, is this meant to imply that there's something supernatural about this peninsula? Or is it just because the developers added sharks and wanted to show that to the player? Why are there dead sharks on the beach? And am I supposed to notice that? The peninsula's wildlife. The wildlife here is extremely bizarre. There are animals that are clearly American, such as the raccoon, but then we've got crocodiles and monitor lizards, species that rarely go further than the equatorial regions, and very large spiders that I think are South American? Rubbing shoulders with Canadian geese, a temperate and subarctic bird that never goes below the equator. So is that a clue? Where the fuck are we? that has deer and croc and komodo dragons, lots of random species of bird, in a fucking pine forest with snow. Is that meant to be an indication that there's something weird with the peninsula? Like the polar bear thing in Lost, that there's some fantasy interdimensional type story, and flying through that is what brought down the plane at the start, and that's going to be the mystery. Why is the wildlife so weird? Was I supposed to notice that? Bring the meat back, yeah. cook it. Whoa! Holy moly. Holy moly. They want my deer. It's mine! I earned it! Piss off, you army bastard. And on the peninsula, people have travelled here. On their own initiative, a lot of people. We see tents, both modern and really old. We see luggage, some new, but some made in... Well, this type of trunk is like from the late 19th to early 20th century. These trunks are potentially more than a hundred years old, and they appear undamaged. What sort of time frame are we dealing with here? Much of this equipment is sitting out in the open, suffering the full effects of the weather, the wildlife, the cannibals. Can you keep it down please love, it's two in the morning. Who have been established as having a habit of pulling things apart. What's he covered in? CDs? Interesting. And yet, most of it seems undamaged. These tents are literally still standing. They've not collapsed after years of rain and snow. Okay, um, is that meant to imply that there's something fucky with time? Who flies crates like these anymore? No one. These planes were reported missing in 1945. But it looks brand new! And on that note, the dynamite. You find dynamite, actual dynamite, sticks of it, boxes of it, so much dynamite. There is a shit ton of explosive material here, presumably bought by the missionaries, because there's that Latin paper nearby. And, well, okay, I have never handled dynamite in my life. I have not so much as seen a stick of dynamite, ever. But even I know, that is a famously temperamental explosive when it's past its weirdly short shelf life because it's nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin sweats when it's left unmoved. It's the reason why you never, ever touch anything you find in any mine or quarry. It is a shock sensitive explosive. I imagine the layman knows that too. Actually, hold on a second, I'm a YouTuber. I can ask lay people, w one minute. Right, so, pretend that you and I are in a cave, okay. and we're exploring this cave together, right? And I am an alien. You need to speak to me like I'm a child. I, I don't understand anything. Okay, we're already there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> so on the floor, right, it's a box, and it looks really old. Okay. And I pick up this box, and I sort of, I blow off the writing on the side. So I go, what is dynamite? 
no. Oh, goodness. Um. Ooh. Oh, shit. Oh, fuck. Get away. Nope, nope. I do not trust you. Oh, shit. Put that down. Stop shaking the fucking box. Put it down very slowly and very gently. Yeah, I don't know if I would want you to hold that. I've probably just dropped my lit torch at your feet and pegged it. Dynamite is a Swedish invention. It's an explosive. Uh, use it for mining, I guess. It was discovered by Alfred Nobel. Because he used the money from the creation of dynamite to fund the Nobel Peace Prize. So it's a way of relocating something very quickly with a very loud bang. I think dynamite is glycerol based. Which is a, a chemical that we use as the basis for lots of explosives. We mixed it and then covered it in wax to make it nice and stable. It allowed us to make railroads, create tunnels. It's very, very old explosive. If that lights off in here, we could collapse this cave. Bad boom boom. Okay, colour me surprised. Not everyone knew that dynamite is unstable when it's old. Only a small fraction knew. Dynamite is made from nitroglycerin and a binder, and when it gets old, the nitroglycerin can seep out and gets a bit unstable. A very unstable liquid that would explode if you would nearly look at it. Well, you're, you're best just putting the box down and not touching it anymore. Old dynamite's really subjective to fucking movement. It will explode. Dynamite that has been left alone for a while. I don't know if it's nitroglycerin or the stabilizer starts to crystallize on the outside, making it incredibly unstable. Any shock can set it off and make it go boom. Is that a problem? if you want to use dynamite in your story? No, not normally, because rarely is it old dynamite. But here, if you've got all of the clues correct in your head, this is meant to be, on purpose, incredibly old dynamite from like the 19th century, improperly stored in a cave. And the game developers had the ability to put in more modern explosives. There are modern cave explorers and surveyors, but they didn't. They explicitly picked ancient dynamite that should explode instantly when I do this. So is that a clue? Like, is this a setup placed here to look old? Did this dude here actually die very recently and he only looks desiccated because there's some sort of supernatural plot thing that we haven't discovered yet? Or is there timey-wimey weirdness with this place? Or is it none of the above? And it's just a further expression of the quality seesaw problem because they thought, well, we want to give the player 19th century dynamite and they didn't bother reading the Wikipedia page on nitroglycerin once? I mean, fuck me. Even the writers of Lost know about this. And every single one of those writers is retarded. <laughs> Hey there folks, very late production Soviet speaking. There's one last thing that I want to add here rather than let it slip away. Whilst looking into dynamite and how dangerous it is, I actually stumbled upon this web page typed up by a gentleman called John, who appears to work in mines based over in America. And his experience with old dynamite is actually very different and an interesting counterpoint if true. John says that the danger of sweating dynamite is actually highly exaggerated, that he and his colleagues over the years have actually encountered lots of badly stored, badly degraded dynamite in various unused mine tunnels, and that in most cases, throwing it into a ravine results in absolutely no explosion whatsoever. As, as it turns out, the shelf life for nitroglycerin is really very short. In fact, he goes on to say that a friend with a pharmacy doctorate estimates that after just six months, it's already lost about 80% of its explosive potential, and that the nitroglycerin leaching out of the stick into the environment desensitizes even faster. And then he goes on to claim that, again, according to a friend, the abandoned mine land reports kept since 1961, again I presume in America, haven't listed an accident with old dynamite in 57 years. So its short shelf life might actually be more of a big deal in reality land, compared to the possibility that it's likely to explode when disturbed. So either way you slice it, whatever sweating dynamite really does, be it this ancient volatile explosive that blows you to smithereens if you disrespect it, or just an ineffective stick of wax and sawdust after for a few short years, my point is that it seems kind of weird for the developer to place this type of explosive, especially if every stick is always functional, if the goal is to indicate that it was bought here a really long time ago.
Oh, and the books. Fuck me, the book. Okay, right. There are Bibles everywhere, really everywhere, in soaking wet caves, and in some places, literally submerged in water. But like the dynamite, this is not a centuries-old book. Have you seen what happens to paper when it's damp? It's wood pulp. It decomposes. <laughs> Oh, it's slimy. Ugh. Surely the developers know that, right? We've got to give them the benefit of the doubt. They're not daft enough to put that in, fresh, crisp and clean, submerged in water and claim that that is more than a century old. So that's got to be a wink at the audience, right? Why are these really old books intact? Was I not supposed to notice that? So if I'm being completely honest, it's in better shape than I expected it to be. I thought it would be like a mulch. I mean, it's probably also partially to do with this plastic binder thing. I imagine if it was stuck together with wax or something, it would be, uh, completely knackered. But still, this was just a few weeks? Imagine what this would look like in a few years. And for some people watching, don't worry, the Bible's fine, it was a bait and switch. Guess what I decided to soak instead? <laughs> Can you at least see what I mean? In a game where you're meant to pay attention to clues, they're literally putting clues in front of you to find, and your character even holds them up to his face. It's a paintbrush, dude. And you find that they don't make any sense if you take them at face value. And so you start to wonder out loud, is that supposed to be the clue then? I have been spotted. Hello. <laughs> I'm not the only one doing this. After completing the game, I rushed to read online discussions that people were having about their experiences. People doing what they normally do on seeing a piece of media, sharing their perspective. And it's a briar patch of people trying to establish timelines, trying to determine when things happened in a haystack of contradictory chronological clues. I remember watching one video by a YouTuber who looked at the bodies that were shown, which I'm having trouble finding again because I'm really bad at my job, and they were saying that this body here, not decaying and coming apart, means that they probably died a very short time before you arrived. And I remember thinking, oh yeah. And then later on you find a man who's hung himself, which I can't show yet, it's a bit of a spoiler. And his body isn't in some cold cave, it's in a room temperature environment. And it's hanging fine, further backing up the rapid timeline. But then of course, there's still the spectre of, did the developers actually think this through, beyond the surface level? My point is, again, mystery stories. People are paying attention. One needs to be very careful about what they telegraph to the player as clues. And we'll get there soon. Trust me, we'll, we'll get there. Some games you can look through the minutiae and go, ah, oh, it's been well thought out. Others, yeah, not so much. I guess hindsight will tell us where this game sits. Further exploring the caves, you'll find many more of these strange, dried out, desiccated bodies. And they stand out so profoundly because it's so obvious that the cannibals left them alone. They're quite clearly not the cannibals themselves. They possess no weapons, no additional limb parts, and some of them even have modern gear. And they're clutching their eyes. Their mouths are open in terror, as if screaming in pain or fear or both sometimes sealed behind these doors, as if something horrible was locked in there with them. One of the most intriguing ones is the one where you find the rebreather. It is, compared to most of the others, very recent. This is not some old missionary. This man or woman died really recently. To have this gear and have it still functional, even its battery is still charged. And they died like that? What the fuck happened to this diver? What did they see when they came out of the water? Whatever it was, it's not here now. Right? Sliding down one particular cave system to the far west of the map will reveal yet another house of horrors. Yeah, uh, with a katana, folded a thousand million times. Made by, um, wow. Oh. Wow. Okay. That's a lot of dead people. That is... A lot of dead people. I don't want to drop down, it's going to mallet me. And again, I can probably get away with it if I'm quick. Here we go. Quick, 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 quick. Slide. Whoa! Shit on toast! Ow! Shit, 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 shit! Got it. Holy fucking shit. 
Yeah, this is pretty fucking grim. But they don't look like cannibals. Who are these corpses? How did they get here? These can't all be the passengers. There are so many corpses. Is this some sort of like... What's this? It's a key card. Sahara. I've heard that name before. There's a shipping container on the beach with that name. These people are from a company called Sahara. Who is Sahara? What are they doing here? Okay. Does a corporation have some sort of a presence on this peninsula? Sitting to one side of the bodies, you'll also find that camera that I've mentioned. Let's have a look at some of these cassettes that I've got. We'll start with the first one. And it's here that the design of the story writer starts to become clear. An office with people milling around. Oh look. A hospital? A sick kid. A sick kid? Opening the artifact. What the fuck is that? They had the kid there with them. Okay. Some sort of machine. Its architecture looks exactly like the door frame. Oh my god, what the fuck? That's really grim. Some sort of corporation was performing some sort of an experiment. An experiment with some sort of artifact that they'd found or built that somehow involved kids. And in doing so, it produced something, maybe. The monsters that we're seeing. Some fucked up corporate thing. This is where they were taken, after the containment failure. These are the corporate employees, and that's why that guy had the keycard. So my next move is to go down into the, into the crater itself, take this keycard, when one does finally make their way there, past scores of the mutants and multiple sacrifice doors, they do indeed find what the keycard is for. Whoa, hold up. Hold up. Okay, now the plot has just... A modern door, and only possible to open with this keycard. With a keypad! And the final destination of our character's abducted son. Okay, the plot has indeed thickened. It's worth also mentioning the nature of this cave, for not only is it one of the deepest places in the game, but it's also of a very different character compared to all the others. Its walls are a shade of red, and it's full of these bladed metal structures, the same material as the sacrifice doors, some of which appear to have failed over the centuries. It's either incredibly old, or just built to look it. And the sound. Throughout this adventure, I couldn't help but notice the walls sometimes drum or groan like a distant, ominous drumbeat. I hear drums. And here is no exception. But from here on, no more clues. Now it's the end game. From this point onwards, the mystery is revealed. You press the keycard to the pad, and it reveals? A secret lab. Its walls coloured red, like the red man we've been seeing. The internal doors are sealed, and you're able to use the ventilation system to move around, and you discover that you're not the only person to be doing so. We've presumably found the temporary home of our mysterious red man, and maybe even a child, maybe Timmy. An email that's been printed out on the wall confirms that the red man's name is Dr. Matthew Cross, an employee of this company, the father of Megan Cross. Anger management issues.
actually ex-employee. Dr. Cross was apparently fired by the Sahara Corporation for misuse of company property, whatever that means, at least according to a separate email that you can find. So he shouldn't be here. He shouldn't be on this peninsula, nor should he presumably have a key card that he can use to come back and forth, and nor should he, should he wish to, have a way to let the cannibals inside. Whoops. Exploring the lab further, you find a crime scene. This whole place is horrendously smashed up. There are mutants and cannibals everywhere, strewn dining chairs and tables. Some people online have even noticed that not only does the facility have uninterrupted power, but there are bowls of food in the canteen as if people were eating. Maybe our red man, or maybe the employees that we found earlier. And there's a man who's hanged himself, presumably to escape the horror unfolding around him, yet his body hasn't decomposed. Again, it's really hard to establish a timeline, but surely this could only have happened within the last few days, maybe even the last few hours. Sahara seems to work in both genetics and pharmaceutical products. They don't appear to be military or government, as far as I can tell. And they found something here, didn't they? The thing in that video. They found something that the cannibals had and were presumably fucking with. Before long, a slideshow, apparently put together by Dr. Cross himself for the purpose of orientation, reveals what they were doing. The Jarius Project. Some sort of very early human trials on cellular modification. There are even these glass containers in the lab areas and the canteens, which I initially thought to be artwork, but might actually be cell samples. Runaway cell replication? That's what the mutants are, aren't they? Products of runaway mutations. They even named them. The women with their extra legs are called Virginias, and the massive rage monsters of dozens of extra arms are called Armsies. Men and women in lab coats made these horrors seeking some sort of life extension breakthrough or anti-aging cream. But what were they using? Well, no, hang on, Megan was in a wheelchair. Oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. That sucks. That really, really sucks. That really, really, really sucks. There's at least 20 kids. They were experimenting on at least 20 kids. They were using children as guinea pigs, long before the project is even ready for human trials. And the results are something from a nightmare. Surprisingly though, it doesn't seem like they were doing it without consent. There's a scientific magazine that seems to show the artifact that they've discovered, discussing rumours that it's able to bring back the deceased. We see the orientation video explain that funding is very much forthcoming from interested parties. The parents of the children. They were terminally ill, weren't they? Whatever they were doing to them, this was the last roll of the dice. So what does Timmy have to do with any of that? Why did the red man take him? His daughter Megan, she died here, didn't she? Why bring our son? In the next room, you find the artifact, and we get our answer. What the fuck is that? It's built into the bedrock. Inside this mount, They built the facility around it, didn't they? That's why they're here. Jesus, even being near it is intimidating. Malice feels like it radiates from it. Whatever this thing is meant to do, how could it possibly be good? It's hooked up to a gurney with wires drawing something from it. They put someone in it and then they monitor them. I think? For what purpose? To heal people? To resurrect them? But what does the device draw from? What energizes it? Do I want to? Okay. Oh. Holy fucking shit. In a genre that's defined by player control, the game takes it from you now and makes you watch this. A 
father removes the body of his child, merely used as a battery to resurrect another's. That's Timmy. His life has been taken so that Megan may live. He dutifully returns the toy he so carefully assembled and goes to say his last goodbyes. Or does he? What's he doing? This machine takes life from one child and gives it to another. No, 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 no. If the machine worked once, it can be made to work again. No, dude, no, 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 no. He can do it. We can do it. No, dude, don't do it. He's doing it. It is implying that... Hang on. The device has accepted the receiver. It now requires only a sacrifice in order to proceed. No, no, what are you doing? No, 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 dude. This is stupid. This is super stupid. But how can we proceed? Dr. Cross, he stormed this facility with the cannibals, didn't he? To get access to this machine, to use it to save his daughter, and they killed everybody, all of the possible children. They're all dead with the exception of... No, 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 we're not doing that. We're not finding Megan. Tell me that's not what we're supposed to do. It's at this point in the game that my expectations are reaching new heights. The game is asking you whether you can go into this facility, find and grab a frightened little girl who is probably living in those vents, who just came back from being literally dead, and then seal her in this malevolent torture box to suffer a horrific death just to serve as a living battery to return life to your son. I don't... That's really... I'm not... This is really fucked. I'm not killing a little girl to save someone who's already dead. That's not happening. Can he do that? The game has given you back the controls. Can you do that? With my expectations rising, my mind briefly flashes to the quality thing. Surely, that's in the past. It's the home stretch. There's no way it can dip. Everything is being set up and everything is sounding incredible. There's nowhere to go but forward. Find. Megan. Before long, you'll find Dr. Cross. In the end, he wished for Megan, his beloved daughter, to return to him. But by the look of things, he got something more. Daddy's dead? Frown? She killed him? Killed him with crayons? What sort of an eight-year-old could do that? Dr. Cross's journey ends here, but his quest one involving the grim determination of a grieving father, goes with you. You briefly spy a paper on the desk that tells of a second artifact on this peninsula, one that, the paper warns, if misused, might be used to bring down a plane. How you and Timmy got here is revealed. Closing the door behind you, you go to find Megan Cross. Megan. Throughout all of your time here, time spent trying to understand this place, you notice things that are supernatural. But what happens when the supernatural notices you?
What's wrong? What the fuck? What? What? Okay. Okay. No. Holy shit! Holy fucking shit! What? Huh. Something has erupted from Megan. I need something bigger. It burns. This is no mutation. No mere cell replication. It might charge me if I move too far. It isn't human. Reload, reload, reload. Where's it going? Something alien is bursting out of this little girl. It's birthing more of them. Ah! Screaming and slithering. Sliding and slicing. Ah! Doesn't seem to be having any effect on it. Am I even hurting? Ouch! It shrieks at you with vocal cords that have never known human speech. Burn it! It can move faster than anything that size should be able to move. Holy shit, the fed! What the fuck? And you fumble with your weapons, your arrows, huh. your every shot and your every bomb. What's it doing? Oh no. With one single objective now, one single thing you must do. I'm running out of armor. Merely survive. Shit on toast. Ah! Ah! Up! Get up! I need to burn it again. Hang on. Go, 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 go. Burn it! Shit. Bow an arrow quick. This way, quick. Back up, back up, back up. Whoa! Fuck. I'm out of flares? I'm out of flares. Fuck. Shit, the bit. Hang on. Oh, God, 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 God. Shit. Finally, though, having threaded it with more arrows than you can count and dousing it with all of your flames, you succeed. I've got one string of armor left and that's it. Oh! It crashes to the ground, unable to hold itself together with such an onslaught of injuries. It's dead. Whatever dead means for a monster inhabiting a resurrected corpse. You go to pick up Megan's plastic wrapped remains and carry them back to the artifact. Halfway there though. What am I doing? And at the risk of a controversial take, this moment right here is where the game's quality overtook Bioshock for me. This tiny development team have made something that struck harder for me than the whole concept of Bioshock. They're actually doing similar things in this particular instance. The player is being asked whether they can sacrifice the life of a child for their own needs. But where Bioshock spent virtually no time at all endearing the little sisters to you, this game tries to build an attachment by making you the father of an abducted son and giving your victim, Megan, not just a telegraphed presence in the story, not just signs of her humanity, but one hell of a hard luck story. Megan's done nothing wrong. She didn't deserve any of this. She was dealt the shittiest of hands, a terminal illness, stealing her life away before she ever got the chance to live it. She deserves so much more than to suffer and die here. But then, so does Timmy. And also, both games play with the removal of control, done so as a moment of surprise in Bioshock, a meta-commentary on a video game player's compulsion to follow quests given by NPCs, and yet here, you are compelled to do what you're doing because you're an inconsolable father in a hyperactive grief fit. You don't have the freedom to not think about it, only the overwhelming drive to do anything, anything, to save your son. As such, it felt like I didn't have a choice in the matter, cradling poor Megan back towards that wretched, unholy thing pulsing in the next room, like I was merely a spectator to a mistake. A small relief then, for me, as one reaches the machine, to find that the interface reports that no living sample is detected. Yeah, she's gone. Maybe the poor girl can finally be at peace but your character isn't at peace. No credits roll, no ending appears. Instead, a key card is retrieved from Megan's body and it opens the nearby door to Artifact 2 and leaving Timmy with the machine, you go onwards seeking a solution. After a slight journey, you locate another research area through caved-in areas that the cannibals have smashed through. But as you go, you notice something curious. There's a sacrifice door here. There are some coffee cups nearby, implying that the Sahara employees knew about it and were perhaps trying to figure it out, but they clearly couldn't open it. The mechanism is vastly different, and we can presume that they were far too busy with their existing work. Strange. It's probably not important. 
Eventually, after climbing over more corpses, you find the research site and the other artifact. This one is far up in the northern mountain. Its purpose is unknown. The paper before you warns that improper use of this device might bring down an aircraft. Some sort of pulse. Cross fired it on purpose, didn't he? The control pad beeps at you. And now, the game gives you the exact same horrible choice. It's a little weird that the corporate computer would have a readout of exactly which children are on the plane and how old they are. But honestly, everything's been so great so far, I'm willing to roll with it. But can you do it? Now that you're standing in Cross's shoes, could you kill for your child? Would you kill for your child? Would you damn so many dozens of innocent people to the horror show that awaits them below, knowing that they'll be strung upside down and sliced open by the cannibals, all whilst begging for help? Could you wander into the wreckage of that plane, covered in red, and grab a frightened child? Could you carry them down into hell and impale them inside a machine from a nightmare whilst they beg you for mercy? Could you do that? Could you do that? What are you, coward or killer? Personally, I couldn't. Coward. Any day. And this is where the ending hard forks. If you use the device, it immediately plays ending number one. I'll talk about that in a moment. But if you don't, if you, like me, approach the emergency shutoff, the machine behind you sputters and dies, and then probably for the last time, it goes silent. There's an elevator nearby. You can use it to descend from the mountain to the ground level, and after a short climb, a short swim, and one stick of dynamite later, you're back, in the forest, alone. Bye, Timmy. Does he have to do that? And that's it. That's the forest. Okay. So what has this huge ass video, the longest one on my channel in fact, really been about? Yes. It's about how open world survival games have been trying to do things to stand out, adding stories for some being one of them, which I think is interesting. And yes, it's been about how quality assurance is very important, that you have to have an eye towards the play experience of the end user and the big picture, lest you deliver something weird. But more than anything, it's been descriptive, like purely descriptive, of the forest's story experience, overtly so. I've been trying to talk you through the plot in almost the same order that I experienced it in. Every time my voice went like this, it was to vocalize a question that I'd spoken aloud on stream, usually with far more words, to bring you into the same headspace that I was in when I finished this game, for reasons that will become clear in a moment. Because as you might have noticed, I mentioned a lot of things there, didn't I? My head swam with theories. By the looks of the online discourse, so did lots of people's. Sure, not everything that I personally saw would lead to something. I'd no doubt misunderstood a few things, misinterpreted some elements of the story, but it felt like there was so much left untouched. And so I couldn't help but wonder, how is this story going to land now? So I set off for the yacht. That had to have been Matthew Cross's. It's why Megan's drawings are framed in there. We've been sitting on his escape route the entire time, haven't we? I got to the boat and I promptly boarded it and found that yes, Megan's keycard does indeed work on the door. And it slid back to reveal a bedroom area with more Christian crosses, more Bible pages, more of Megan's drawings and... Wait, what's this? Why would this be here? One final unexpected jigsaw piece. It's a small ominous looking device that looks a lot like the artifact, doesn't it? Red angry daddy crucifix. 
you can practically hear the clatter of the clues shifting around in my head. This device, right at the apparent end of the game, looking just like the artifact and hidden away all this time. Why is this here? Did this belong to Megan? Was this her bedroom? Why does she, or Dr. Cross, have what looks like a piece of the artifact? How does this all fit together around the other clues? Does this fit into the artifact itself, or that last door? Is something behind that door? What's behind that door? My expectations for this game were still riding high, still coasting after the tightly written experience of the Sahara Lab, and now with this new development at the 11th hour of a gadget that potentially nobody knew about, and I was still waiting for the credits to roll? Very intriguing. Just had a horrible realisation. So I rushed back to the mountain. Let's get back to the door. Okay. This is the trickiest part of the video. This is where I risk losing you. But I just want to describe, essentially, what was in my head. What trajectory I thought this plot was moving in. Something that is very personal to one's own play experience, and most viewers or players can simply shrug off with a simple, well, that's not what I thought. But please bear with me. I want to try and bring you into my headspace so you can see what threw me so greatly. Where did I think this story was going to end? Possibility number one. Is this item, in actuality, really important? This entire game has been about some mysterious, evil-looking device that does fucked up shit to children fed into it. But tantalizingly, it seems to have miraculous, life-saving properties that for hundreds of years, I think at least, people have been trying to harness. Is all of that merely the result of a horrible malfunction? A malfunctioning machine? Is this tiny device meant to be paired with it in order to make it work? Maybe there's some plot exposition that I missed that revealed how Megan found this. Perhaps some trinket that the scientists, her father especially, dismissed or paid very little attention to. So focused were they on trying to make fucking anti-aging creams or whatever. The drawings on the yacht now have some new meaning in this context. Did Megan? sketch these? Was this item influencing Megan? Is this why the device only works on children? Is this thing the key in the possession of a child? No idea. But when we go back there and plug this in, will it be revealed that everything that's happened, that the deaths of all of these people on the peninsula were for nothing? It would be like the ending to The Mist, a father falling to his knees to shriek in anguish as you realise that Timmy and Megan and everybody on the plane died for nothing. That would be pretty powerful, I thought, though it doesn't really come close to answering so many parts of this. So probably not. But still, you know, fun to think about. I have in my hand what appears to be a plot MacGuffin. What could this physically do? Possibility in my head number two, and this is the one that I banked on, starting with this new question. Why children? Why does the artifact want children? In the center of the forest, the Sahara Corporation found an artifact, an ancient artifact, pitched black and seething, pulsing with an unknown power. We can't be sure exactly what the cannibal people were doing when they were discovered, but since there's at least one charcoal drawing of a Virginia mutation from centuries ago, we can probably hazard a guess, can't we? They were sacrificing their children. They didn't care about profit, they weren't doing it for science, they were doing it for cultural and religious reasons, weren't they? Religious rituals that appear to be, as repeatedly shown, extremely elaborate and old. This is not some ancient artifact to them, is it? This is an altar. A sacrificial altar, with a literal bowl to collect blood beneath the sacrifice, which other YouTubers have noticed. The child would be impaled and killed as the doors closed on them, a reservoir beneath their feet to collect their blood. Upon which, for centuries, again, I assume, the natives have been sacrificing their kids, seeing them rise up again in the name of something, some twisted faith. What is this? But do the kids rise up again? The things seem to attack humans on sight, at least the humans not pledged to worship this icon. And Megan herself, she murdered her own father almost immediately with crayons. Was it really Megan who came back? Or something else? 
And the cannibals look at their behavior, not just attacking people, not merely eating them, but twisting them, perverting them, reassembling them, making effigies that I thought were paying tribute, but now I think is mockery. This is mockery, isn't it? Destroying the false idols of the outsiders and then bending them to serve new forms, be it modern torches or tennis players or Japanese woodprints that I assume that they've seen showing samurai, or Christians who put these crosses everywhere. They're twisting the symbolism. And on that note, the Christian iconography, it's everywhere. Really everywhere. It's not Jewish, it's not Buddhist, it's not Sikh, it's not Wiccan, and it's not Hindu. It's very specifically Christian, and those Christians that did arrive seemingly freaked the fuck out with whatever they saw in those caves. Building barriers with crucifixes and perhaps trying to dynamite the entire sinkhole to bury it forever. Maybe. That part isn't clear. And the sinkhole itself, there it is, like a gaping wound in the land. As though the rock itself has been melted away by the sheer fucking evil of what is beneath it. The developers really want you to notice the sinkhole. It's not just big, it's right in the middle. And several underground pathways exit into it. One cave is literally just a dead end to go, look at this sinkhole, before you turn around and keep exploring. And right at the base of it, at the deepest part of the caves, right down with the jagged metal blades, with walls coloured red, is a cave. And I didn't know this at the time, but I do know now. This is called, on the wiki, the Hell Cave. Can you start to see where I'm going? This whole thing with Sahara. Is that just misdirection? Is that a red herring? It seems so obviously detached from the events on the peninsula, so laser focused on the artifact and the making of the mutants, a corporation that's only just bought the peninsula and therefore is, chronologically, very new on the scene. And I started to wonder if that is on purpose, leading you away for a potential reveal. Is there something beneath this peninsula? Something malevolent. Something that the blood-collecting child sacrifice machines are helping to keep here. Calling them here to sacrifice their children, hence all of the visitors who are coming here despite the extremely obvious danger. The cave walls groan and drum with unknown sounds as though something is moving. And the desiccated bodies in cavern after cavern, frozen in fear, appear to have nothing to do with the artifact. And yet here they are, clutching their eyes and dying as though in agony. You literally have to stumble over them. The level design forces you. They're not just inside caves. This room here, stuffed with screaming skeletons, is the single path between the two Sahara test sites. And the rebreather that you need to complete the game? It's sitting next to one of the corpses. This is a huge fucking red flag. The game designer really wants you to notice these bodies. But why did they die like that? What did they see? Are these the few who stumbled upon the truth of what's down here? And lastly, the man in red. Revered by those cannibals. Why this reaction when the cannibals see you painted red? Are they backing away? Because I'm covered in the red pe- Oh look! Am I being worshipped? They fall to the ground in supplication or flee in terror. The dominant theory online is that Matthew Cross drew this on the cave wall himself, that he put the fear of himself in the cannibals, or that even the Sahara Corporation, whose corridor is the same shade, used some sort of psycho conditioning to keep the cannibals away. But like, did they? I think these cannibals have been doing this for a very long time, and they clearly don't fear the people from the outside with their technology. Not one bit. They don't fear mere men, do they? Are they worshipping a malevolent entity that they can only conceptualise in their twisted ideology as a massive being clad in red? Is there an important entity in Christian theology that was famously banished to a place underground? An entity that twists iconography and the creations of God, who might call to people to come here, whose evil seeps into the land, and who is often, in the very broadest sense, associated with death, suffering, damnation, sin, and at the very least, in the last 200 years or so in media, is heavily associated with the colour red? 
Again, with art, our individual experiences will always differ, but reaching the end of the game, I had so many questions that just didn't line up with the plotline about Sahara. Is the game about to reveal that the developers know that? Are we going to open that door between the two artifacts and descend into the heart of the forest only to find what's really going on? Maybe in one final moment before we ourselves join the desiccated dead? Are we going to look beneath this mountain, look beneath this forest, and stare into the abyss? asking why our son was killed, only to find that the abyss smiles back. Cut to credits. Approaching this mysterious door with Megan's toy in hand, things were looking good. I was bracing for something epic, some sort of a conclusion, and I'm just going to cut to the live stream, I'm just going to shut up. You can see what happens next. So with this strange device that we found inside the yacht, let's see if we can figure out the secret of this thing. What the hell is the forest? It's a rock. What is it? Oh. Stab what? Myself? Why? Can I take this back up to Timmy? Oh Christ. What are you doing? Wait. I'm not sure I understand. Do you want to know what this ball is? Have I missed something? It's an item that was added after 1.0, and its purpose? It just turns the cannibals off, so you can build in creative mode. The game ended when I stepped out of the cave? I, 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 this is just a little bauble ball that keeps the cannibals away? Hang on a second. Am I being fair here? My expectations plummeted, but ultimately, that's a me problem, isn't it? I drew these connections from what I thought were clues, and I simply got it wrong. That wasn't where the story ended up going. That's enough for one man to be spluttering in confusion at the end of a live stream. Um, okay, I thought that, is there no, like, so the game, uh, right, mm. But there's really not enough to be making a three hour YouTube video about how your head cannon was wrong. I can do all of this fancy arts and crafts bullshit to my heart's content, but that doesn't mean that's the story they're trying to tell. Even if I think it's cooler than <laughs> whatever the hell this is. And maybe you agree, maybe you don't. This bit here is just to entertain you and show you where my head was at the time when I completed the game. So what is my real point? This thing opens a door which reveals a bauble, and what's behind it isn't some big reveal insofar as what's happening here on the peninsula, it's just another artifact to find. So ultimately that just lives up here, doesn't it? It's just, it's just another artifact of many. So what is the story then? What connects all of these different elements? Hmm? You start the game in a plane crash. What caused it? Dr. Cross caused it, on purpose actually, when he brought the plane down with Artifact 2 in the Sahara lab. Why? Well, he needed to abduct a child, a living child, to sacrifice him and resurrect his deceased daughter who died in an unrelated mishap in the Sahara lab and was probably dying anyway? Which is why she was there. Why did Dr. Cross spare you? And why did all of the cannibals ignore you despite taking everyone else? Ah. Uh... Ignore me! Here, in the peninsula, the Sahara Corporation are semi-secretly working with an ancient and unknown device that they found underground. The true purpose of which is unknown unknown, but it seems to be able to resurrect the dead in specific conditions, those conditions being a living child has to be impaled inside of it. So Sahara were using the artifact to work on Project Jarius, and Dr. Cross wanted to use it to save his dying daughter. Jarius is some bloke in the Bible who had a daughter that Jesus saved one time, and Sahara were intentionally killing children with the device in order to resurrect them, which produced wildly mutated results, which are those things wandering around in the forest 
forest, mostly because there was some sort of a containment failure, probably caused by Dr. Cross, because he actually got fired for misusing company property, at least according to an email that you find in the Sahara lab at the end of the game, and therefore presumably he was going to lose access to the device and therefore the means to save his daughter. And so he used that incident and your abducted son to harness the artifact's mysterious power to bring his daughter back to life, who promptly murders him because she's a literal monster now. But when you get to the Sahara lab, you find this daughter and you kill her, and then you're in Dr. Cross's exact shoes, and it loops back to the plane crash, a different plane crash, and you can do exactly what he did to acquire a sacrifice, or just don't, and the game ends. That's the forest. And acknowledging that, yes, I am just a sample size of one, and these blue questions are mine alone, and some people probably just won't see it that way, or just not put emphasis on the same things that I've put emphasis on, how many times did my hand move from the top of this board? Because there's like, a lot that the story never touches, never even goes near. All of the questions that I asked in this playthrough above the string were relevant, or rather, answered by the plot. But all of the questions below, they range from being given an implied answer that is ultimately unimportant, or just being ignored as though they're not even there, despite some very clear and deliberate setup. And some of the questions are fucking bonkers, because the situation that created them is impossible, it's contradicted by the plot. And this is what I came up with, this red line all the way up here. <laughs> And so I asked a few minutes ago, with such a laser focus on the Sahara Corporation and their experiments, their creating of the mutants in service of an anti-aging whatever, if that was intentional misdirection, a big fat red herring to draw you, the player, away from what is really going on here in the forest. All of the things that could potentially connect these elements together. The cannibals, their effigies, the Christian symbolism, the sinkhole, why is the peninsula so fucking weird? All of these dried and desiccated bodies. These people died here looking at this. Begging? Praying? How the fuck did they die? But as it turns out, there is no extra puzzle piece that we don't have. And this bit up here isn't the red herring. That's what the game is about. And everything below it is essentially misdirection. But without exaggeration, that's the entire fucking game! This bit down here, this is the forest! That bit is the opening cutscene, which is about 1 minute and 20 seconds. And that bit is the one hour in the Sahara lab, where everything wraps up and then the credits roll. Down here is where you're roaming and finding food and water, upgrading your gear and base building and exploring, fighting the cannibals and seeing their effigies, seeking clues above ground and then going into the caves to find what exactly happened to your son, doing the open world parts in an open world survival game, in which you're potentially building up a bow wave of questions insofar as what exactly is going on here. And apart from like, two major things? As in, where did the mutants come from, and what's the deal with these corpses in this one cave? The questions that you'll probably come up with don't fucking matter. This right here is what is so strange about the forest. I came in here, post-Subnautica, wondering if plots added to survival games in post would feel detached. But the forest plot is so detached, it may as well be the ending to a completely different game. So like, the Katana Men posed around a campfire in that cave with the katana sword. That has nothing to do with anything at all. It was one of the most striking visual clues. It's why I've referred to it multiple times. Clearly set up for the player to observe. And the implication of what the cannibals were doing here? It's a total nothing. It was added in patch 0.20 and I assume it's just, here's the katana. It's just a weapon drop for people to find. The same appears to be true of the chainsaw, added in patch 0.60 and then moved from one cave to another. It has absolutely nothing to do with anything at all. These people that have been sawn in half, the demonstration that the cannibals know how to use modern technology, and yet choose to live the way they do, none of that becomes relevant at all. The developers wanted to add the chainsaw and thought nothing more beyond that, I assume. It's not even a red herring on purpose to hide some other twist in the story. It's just been added and that's the end of it. So all of the things the cannibals have actually been doing this whole game, the building of the effigies, what they 
they might mean, the extremely specific materials that they're using and why they're using them. It has no narrative importance, nor does the implication that their customs are complex as you try to understand them and unlock the mystery of why they're doing it. There is apparently no why, or if there is, the game doesn't go near it. The artifact isn't said to be mysteriously whispering to them, to tell them to gather organs or people or do whatever the sacrifice doors are asking. It's a big nothing. I assume all the effigies are in the game because they look spooky. This guy with the cross is all over him. Does that tie into the missionaries in some fashion? Some commenters online have been like, ah yes, the missionaries, some of them must have become the cannibals. But if you do that, using head cannon to connect the dots, apparently it's more thought than the devs ever put in, because the Christian missionaries have nothing to do with the story either. I suppose I've recognised something of a tonal contradiction in my script here, because I started playing the forest again knowing that its story was added in post. That's what I came here to see, so it does feel weird for me to be railing on them for things not quite lining up. But like, I didn't expect it would be to this degree. So hold on, the cannibals themselves, the cannibal people, they apparently have nothing to do with either of the artifacts. I noticed that almost immediately after I finished the game and I thought, no, that's ridiculous. You must have missed something. But strangely, no. <laughs> there is no direct relation between the presence of the cannibal people and the plot that they ended up implementing. The fact that they're on the peninsula and being extremely aggressive, disassembling their victims, stacking their organs in piles, the fact that they have these visually different, often strikingly decorated tribes, or that some of them are clearly sickly with some unknown affliction. None of it apparently has anything to do with these strange artifacts that end up being the fulcrum of the entire plot. The mutants are tied in. These things here, these are apparently heavily mutated children that have been fed into Artifact 1. But these guys, these guys right here? don't appear to have any actual bones in the story. The device is not set up to have any negative effects on anyone who goes near it. Sahara built their entire corporate office literally on top of it, with no biohazard containment procedures at all. So why are the cannibals living here? There is so much speculation online about them. How could there not be? It's arguably a game about a forest full of cannibals. Its mechanics massively involve building bases to survive attacks from cannibal people, and then pushing back and exploring the caves patrolled by them. Folks online are going, oh no, they're the missionaries. Or even, oh no, they're druids that have been cursed? That's why they move around the trees and make totems? Or even, no no, they're test subjects from the Sahara Corporation, which clearly can't be true because some of these tribes are much older. So much speculation speculation as to where they tie in, how they tie in, because they apparently don't? There is nothing but headcanon to patch any of these gaps. Because somebody wanted to make an open world survival game with cannibal people, and so they made it so that your player arrives in a plane crash on this peninsula, and they end up heavily interacting with them. You see their effigies, you see their work, you even end up getting abducted by the cannibal people if you, you know, lose all your health. But after that initial starting point, as development rolled on for years and years, they just kind of like move up and away from everywhere they started? It becomes a story about a sort of umbrella corporation doing their crazy experiments to try and get some sort of corporate thing, and then eventually it becomes a story about grieving fathers and the lengths that they will go to to save their loved ones. And yeah, while that's kind of cool, it just kind of forgets that you have to come up with a reason to put in the cannibal people? And hang on a minute, these mutants are the products of the Sahara experiments. They're the children that are terminally ill, right? I've been wearing the skin of the children as armour the entire game. These got out and are roaming the peninsula, probably because of Dr. Cross, whatever he did to cause the containment failure, which couldn't have been that long ago. You know, the fresh food, hanging dude, no decomposition, all that jazz. I mean, there's literally some of the mutants behind fragile wooden walls. Are the cannibal people just as confused about the mutants as we are? Like, fucking hell, the new guy's ugly. Ugh. They have no fucking idea what's going on. They're just a bunch of random cannibals minding their own business aren't they? I have absolutely no doubt that this will be immediately fixed in the sequel. The presence of other cannibals near other artifacts in other areas would be pretty solid confirmation that they're intertwined. But like, it's so fucking weird to me. I can't get over how weird it is that the relationship between the artifacts and making the cannibals was never 
were made explicit in the forest. Imagine if you're playing Dead Space and you arrive at the USG Ishimura and you go deck by deck fighting monstrously mutated people the entire game, only to find that the markers that everyone is obsessing over seemingly have nothing to do with it. People are studying them because if you lick them, you get cured of erectile dysfunction or something. That's basically the situation in 2014's The Forest. The cannibals were added as enemies to fight right from early access launch and as far as I can tell, unless I've missed something, they have fuck all to do with the plot. It's just amazing. When someone does this vision board thing, it's to show how everything is connected, you know? Like a conspiracy or whatever. But bizarrely, when you map out the complete product like this, it reveals how little things are attached to each other. All of these elements just seem to exist in their own isolated groups. Features added with reason, sure, but often not as part of a broad high-level plan that's being fed iteratively through a development cycle. As in, the cannibals, their effigies and their displays seem to be doing their own thing in their own bubble, as in the artifact isn't said to be creating or empowering them or whatever. The only thing they're really doing is serving as obstacles for the player. The Sahara Corp and Dr. Cross are just doing completely their own thing, essentially ignoring the rest of the forest behind the giant armoured door. Everything that they need for their operation they apparently just fly in, like ordering takeout. They're not interacting with the forest in any meaningful capacity. The sinkhole is just there. It's not defined to have been created by the artifact, nor is it creating anything or really influencing anything. There are plenty of caves that aren't connected to the sinkhole and the cannibals are hanging out and they're fine. It's basically just a big trip hazard. The missionaries are also on their own. They just turned up one day, drew things, built big walls, and then died. And the missing people is the weirdest one. These just kind of exist with an item for you to find or not and that's the end of it. There's no like clues amongst the campsites to indicate that oh children are coming here, parents are bringing children, why could that be? There's nothing like that. It's like here's a campsite, here's your bow upgrade, done. And the cave explorers, as far as I can tell, are literally just cave exploring. They have nothing to do with anything here. They are literally just spelunking. <laughs> Can you see how weird this is? I mean, this board took me like two or three days to make. Even less so if it's just scribbled post-it notes. I'm just trying to present it visually to you. But this game took what, like five years to make? They couldn't spare two or three days? Even after they decided to put in the story to just plan how it all connects? I feel really guilty because, yes, this is a very small development team. It was apparently about four to ten people at any given time. And I don't want to go in hard on some studio getting their footing. I'm not expecting perfection. But speaking as a QA, what matters is the end product, not the size of the development team. And planning this out is really simple. The game Outer Wilds started as one dude's master thesis. Plotting out how a story world is going to fit together is one of the most straight forward elements, even for a team of one. Hi there everyone, just in late production over here. I would just like to thank the artists that have helped me throughout this video. There's five of them in total and their help has been invaluable. But you see, one of those artists appears to have gone rogue. <laughs> For I asked the artist Ilsa if she could draw me piles of human skulls, and it appears that amongst those skulls is a human bum. It's a bit weird, but okay then. And then later on, I asked Ilsa to make the cave background for the dynamite segment, and one of the bats on the ceiling appears to have a very large bottom. <sighs> God damn it, Ilsa. And so lastly, a new question springs up on the board. It's not strictly relevant, but I'd be frustrated with myself if I didn't include it. If these are children fed into the machine, then why aren't the game models designed to look like children? Have you seen children? They're fucking terrifying! They've been used in horror media for years for that exact reason. Every single one of these creatures is actually a little boy or girl between the ages of 4 and 12. And yet they're massive rage monsters, or obviously full-grown women. Multiple full-grown women who try to beat you to death with their vaginas, and whose secondary weapon is basically child support. And if you go into the game's cheat console and type spawn armsy, you get an armsy. If you type spawn pale, you get a pale cannibal. 
Oh, reminds me of my first date. If you type Spawn Virginia, you get nothing. If you type Spawn Virgin, you get nothing. If you type Spawn Verge, you get nothing. Do you want to know what spawns a Virginia? <clears throat> Yeah, there was no plan to make these children. No fucking way. They had these models by update 0.01 and they didn't plan how they were going to fit in, so they fucking don't. They just throw in a line about accelerated aging and then just try to ignore it. So wait, Timmy's drawings. Timmy didn't draw these. How could he draw these? He was seemingly unconscious having just been in a plane crash, but like, okay, Matthew Cross caused this plane crash specifically to get a sacrifice for his dead daughter. Now the game wants to imply that he had to get Timmy to scuba dive. That's what this means, right? Timmy has to scuba. And granted, both entrances to the Sahara base that we have use underwater cave diving sections. But do you know what? This is a big facility, with lots of other doors and unexplored sections. What, did they really use flooded tunnels to go back and forth and build all this shit underground? Did they seriously lift all of this stuff by helicopter? There is another way in and out of Sahara, like definitely. And I know that this point is a little bit, you know, ludo-narrative dissonancy, but none of the cannibals can fucking swim. Not a single one of them can swim. So I'm saying there's definitely another entrance that isn't underwater. But just backing up, I'm going too far down that rabbit hole. My point is, the red man just needs to get Timmy alive from the plane to the artifact. That's all he needs from him. Whatever route is the least amount of a headache. So by the time that you are regaining consciousness at the start of the game, Timmy is probably already dead. I presume Cross's plan was to just go straight from the plane to Artifact 1, pick up his resurrected daughter, and then just leave. In his yacht. If he'd not been slain by whatever the fuck inhabited Megan, you would never even know about the yacht. So... Who's drawing the drawings? Oh, you know, I really want my daughter to be alive, but let's stick around here on the edge of the sinkhole so Timmy can draw some art. Is there some random kid we don't know about that's knocking around in the forest? Is it the fat kid? Is he secretly sketching and then leaving these everywhere? <laughs> I initially suspected Megan. Megan does drawing. She even has a crayon pouch with her name on it, which I thought at the time was meant to be a aha. You thought it was Timmy this whole time. Ah. But like... Megan's fucking dead. That's the whole thing that kicked off the plot. She's already a corpse by the time you're fucking around with your armrest in the plane. What, did Megan draw these weeks ago, like before the incident on waterproof paper? And Dr. Cross was like, Daddy's gotta go to work in the Sahara lab, honey. You stay here in the cannibal caves for the day, okay? Love you, bye-bye. She didn't do the drawings. Nobody did these drawings. Because surprise, like the katana, like the chainsaw, like the effigies, it was all added with no planning insofar to how it would all come together. And the final version doesn't give any child any time to do any of this. So Timmy wasn't being kept alive. He wasn't being shown the ropes. He was just like a battery, a child-shaped battery to be dragged unwillingly for all of however long it takes to get to Artifact 1. These pictures are absolute bullshit. You get to the end of the game and it just falls the fuck apart on the most basic inquiry. Okay, so like, this connects to nothing, this connects to nothing, this connects to nothing. Okay, right, so the ancient artifact thing. Clearly Lovecraftian, right? Of there being ancient and unknown civilizations in the deep places of the world. And it is very okay if your story doesn't explain the supernatural. Those elements can be greatly cheapened by doing so. Fuzziness in this area is okay. But normally, you get to the end of the story, and the mysterious supernatural thing is the bit left tantalising for the audience. The thing that they keep talking about years later. It's not meant to be flanked by scores of other open questions never addressed. The impact is somewhat lost if the main plot is just as fuzzy as the fuzzy bits. And also, right. The desiccated people don't tie into any properties of artifacts 1 or 2. That much is clear. But just like me, people online have been trying to figure out what the fuck they are. Right after completing the game, I would go to the wiki and find that there's an article on the death artifact. Some speculative artifact that takes life instead of restores it. Which isn't shown to ever exist. The bodies don't fit anywhere and people are trying to figure out where to pin it. No plan was put in place to make these desiccated bodies fit. 
bit. And based on the pattern so far, I'm going to take a guess and say they added the desiccated bodies without any plan. Recurring theme, as you've noticed, there's just no fucking plan. Which is crazy, because the bodies are so well set up in multiple locations. You totally expect that this will relate to something going on, but then it just doesn't. Next, the Christian thing. Everywhere you go in this game, there's Christian stuff. Christian iconography. Perverted Christian iconography. Crucifixes and Bibles. I hope I've been able to communicate just how omnipresent this stuff is. This isn't some bullshit side quest that I've encountered once and I've blown it out of proportion. You are continually tripping over Christian-related stuff right until the very end of the fucking game. The last fucking tunnel that you walk through before you burn the picture? There are Bibles on the floor. But ultimately, ultimately, this is like a minor setting detail. Such weighty presence in your exploration, and by extension I assume in the heads of many. Literally, there are three times where the game stops, plays a quizzical tone, and says, look at this Christian thing. And all it means is, yeah, some people were here ages ago. Probably preachers, could be anyone really. This whole section raises so many thematic questions about the plot's connection to religious stuff. Matthew Cross is scrawling crazy shit on Bible pages. There are black crosses scribbled in his yacht. There are black crosses scribbled on paper in the lab where the cannibals have broken in. And Matthew Cross is literally found dead next to crosses. I assume holding them up in the face of what he perceived to be a demon, and it has like no bones with anything in the story, save for like, the name of the project. The artifact and Megan have nothing to do with Christianity, nor do the cannibals. There's no Satan figure or anything. The only thing it's trying to say is, missionaries found this place, ah, uh, they saw mutants a few centuries ago, ah, uh, one of them drew one, here it is, they drew one. Matthew Cross is, um, he's a Christian, he's a bit weird. That's it. It's a minor setting detail to establish a chronology, or the fact that the antagonist is a bit loopy, which you didn't need because he abducted your son at the beginning, whilst cosplaying as a red jelly baby. It's pretty clear he's a basket case. You could have done all of this with the charcoal drawing slipped between the pages of a copy of God, I love the Ottoman Empire, and it would have been substantially less of a brain fuck. Sorry. Can you see why I made this video? You spend the vast majority of the gameplay around this stuff, pondering what it could all mean, intrigued to see how it ties in, wondering why the Christians died, or staring at that black mark, ooh, where is this going? And it doesn't go anywhere. Why go to such huge setup for the audience, even corroborating with crucifix tattooed cannibals, if it's not going to lead the audience anywhere? Oh, and all of these points about weird chronology, that maybe there's something supernatural about the time in this place, that stuff is appearing more intact than it's meant to be, despite being hundreds of years old. Well, I guess it seems obvious now, like after the game, that none of this was going to lead anywhere. It turns out that, yeah, these are just centuries old Bibles, sometimes immersed in water. This is apparently a hundred year old nitroglycerin, the most temperamental explosive known to man. Still stable, despite a hundred years over its use by date. These tents are just decades old. Still, you know, with the strings in the ground. Despite weather. Cave number five has a daisy chain of floating Bibles just in fresh water for more than a hundred years. Like, I feel I'm being punished here for thinking about this for more than 10 seconds. I'm getting preemptively knocked off because some people are going to be whinging on Reddit later that I overanalyze everything and fair, but this bit, specifically just this bit, this is just basic fucking logic. Who looks at this tent and says, yeah, that's been standing for years and years, possibly even decades. Mm, absolutely. And double whinge. Going down the rabbit hole theory stuff about this game, intrigued to see what other people have made out of it. Some people people are just eating this stuff up uncritically, or piling nonsense on top of the discussion. I watched this one YouTube video, and it was going, this thatch hut was clearly made by the early settlers, and is therefore more than 300 years old. And I'm just looking at it going, no it's fucking not! It's fucking wood! Literally just sticks. This is effectively just a concentrated debris field waiting for the next storm. This isn't hundreds of years old, that's insane. Hello everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel. Oh look, I found this biscuit tin which is quite clearly from the Third Crusade. <laughs> Getting uh, <clears throat> funny looks from members of the public in the park. I'm gonna keep walking. <laughs> 
similar weirdness with the sharks. They put sharks in the water in patch 0.02, the second major version. How do they communicate that there are sharks in the game before the player enters the water? Gee, if only there was something that could be used as visual shorthand to show that sharks might be in the water. No, they're just going to sprinkle some dead great white sharks, massive dead great white sharks, about 10 of them, on the beachfront, just scattered around like packets of quavers. Sorry, did you know that I live on a beachfront? Brighton Beach, I live in Brighton. It's a seaside resort. It has been since 1841. How long have you lived in Brighton, Soviet? Uh, I've lived here my entire life. Do you know how many dead sharks I've ever seen on Brighton Beach? How many dead sharks have you seen on Brighton Beach? Zero. I've seen zero dead sharks on Brighton Beach. Thank you, Soviet. I'll ask our mum. Mum, have you ever seen sharks on Brighton Beach? Oh, you're 36. When are you going to get married? She's never seen a shark on Brighton Beach. It's such a strange creative choice that you're not meant to notice. There's nothing mentioned about the artifact doing weird shit to wildlife. It's like loading a game and then finding 15 dead tigers just lying around the edge of a jungle, a semi-solitary apex hunter to warn you that the game has tigers in it, as opposed to just doing this? Can you see what I mean? God, this game drives me insane! And the peninsula itself. So there's nothing fucky with it. It's just a presumably tricky to reach peninsula. And the question of where did this equipment come from? That's all answered by the plot, isn't it? Explorers and campers and surveyors. People hearing about the rumoured artifact and then just getting attacked by the cannibal people. Well, hang on. In the absence of some timey-wimey weirdness, or extra-dimensional whatever, it becomes even more inexplicable. What happens when someone goes missing? It's almost like we humans search for them, you know? Maybe launch some sort of rescue? Oh yeah, but they've gone missing, you see. Who knows where they've gone? Yeah, there's literally a film crew here. And surveyors with heavy gear. They're chartering boats, and there's at least one helicopter. As in, people aren't just getting wankered, having a kebab, and then waking up here on the peninsula. This takes planning and coordination and supplies being provided by lots of people who aren't going missing, who know where this is. Nobody's noticing this really dangerous place on the map where people keep disappearing? The dangerous cannibal peninsula. So do they not know about the danger? In which case, why the fuck do they not know about the danger? People have been going missing here for fucking centuries. The game on purpose sets that up. Hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people, and everyone just seems oblivious to the threat? Those surveyors, they had me scratching my head in particular. Specifically just them. Have you seen the hardware they're packing? ROV drones. Expensive drones. There's like 20 of these things. They're There's like 19 of these things. Someone sent hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of men and equipment into this place in a very organized fashion. But you're telling me that not one of them, not a single fucking one of these people decided to carry a motherfucking gun? That's right. We're going all British Empire on your bitch ass. I can't say that. This is the stuff that you think about and then put on post-it notes on your wall long before you've done any code. As in, why were none of the missing people found? And as I was pondering that, trying to figure out how this all connects together, I, like many, was trying to determine the timeline. When did things happen as best as I could determine? And... Okay. <laughs> right. I spotted one thing, and I was like, Oh, come on. Okay. The Sahara employees died in some sort of an incident that we can presume Matthew Cross probably caused, right? And our first encounter with the Sahara people has to be this cave. This must be the player's first contact with the Sahara people because it has the key card that you need to open the sinkhole. You have to go here. You have to see this. And so I was trying to sort of work out the logistics, as in, that's a big body pile, and that is quite a long way from the lab. So I was trying to work out, you know, what route was taken, and how many people would it take to get the bodies over here, and then I realised the whole thing was stupid. So I dropped it. I dropped it from my script. But just before I did, I noticed this. The Sahara base, and therefore the artifact, is not in the sinkhole, obviously. It's inside that mountain at the end. You even see it in the diagrams on the wall. And you go up the elevator all the way to the peak. To get to Sahara, you do go down the sinkhole initially. But then you move through the Hell Cave in a straight line, quite some distance. All the way to the armoured door that Sahara put in at the base of their operations. And you just think, no problem. That door is at the root of the mountain, isn't it? This is the lowest level of the Sahara facility, and above us is the mountain. But here's the issue. No, the mountain isn't above you. 
You have a compass. You can tell that you're moving south from the sinkhole, not north. You're going in the direct opposite of the mountain, towards the ocean. In fact, if this map online is correct, the Sahara base at the other side of the Hell Cave is actually here. Like, next to Dr. Cross's yacht? It's almost as far as you can get away from the mountain where the end game is meant to happen. This wasn't planned. The map design wasn't fucking planned. And I know this is petty. This is so fucking petty. Please forgive me. I could not resist. Okay, facing north. One, two, three. I loaded up the end game and I actually paced out my steps throughout the Sahara facility. Three. <laughs> no, 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 no. Knowing that this is the southern point where the end game starts. And then I went to the surface, to the equivalent location, just to see where you'd end up. Uh, north five. One, two. And it was a bit awkward, you know, what with hills and shit. North nine. Yeah. Oh, fuck. But do you want to know where I ended up? <laughs> where Artifact 2 atop the mountain is, according to the map designer? I knew you fuckers were connected to this somehow! I fucking knew it! They put the sinkhole in from 0.16 onwards. Therefore, this hell cave and the entrance to the Sahara lab was at some point after that, many years before they ever thought of the Sahara plot. And I'm saying that due to lack of planning, even basic, extremely high-level planning, the fucking map is upside down. <laughs> Fuck me. Oh, and don't worry, I've not forgotten. What's the other ending? What happens if you do shoot down the plane? Well, you press the button and the plane comes crashing down in front of you, but then it cuts to one year later. Your character is now waiting to appear on a talk show alongside a very unhealthy looking Timmy, and you're promoting your book about your adventures, presumably leaving the part out where you murdered lots of innocent people and sacrificed an innocent child. <laughs> and during a moment before the camera, Timmy seems to go through the same transformation as Megan, and the screen cuts to black. Credits roll. Interesting? Yeah. Memorable. Absolutely. But just like the other ending, it touches on nothing. It just sets up all of this and then cuts and runs. Oh, and later they change the ending. They have Timmy survive so he can go and be in the forest too. So ultimately, what is the purpose of this video? What is the overall point? Well, I feel that the forest is an example of the importance of planning. With whatever you do, frankly, but especially with software, it is so important to interrogate your ideas whilst they're just ideas. Before I was doing this YouTube lark, I was spending my days making software, or more specifically, testing software. And one of the most common activities on development teams that I was a part of, regardless of job role, in an environment that was mostly about app development, which I know is not the same thing as video games, but bear with me, was meetings. We would very frequently be in meetings. We'd gather in a room, sit around tables, and talk about the features that a piece of software should have. What complete looks like. What does X do and what Y does it need. What tests would measure success on developing anything. And what dependencies are there that we need to account for in the coming weeks, be they technical skill that we need to hire for, or licensed software that we just don't have. We'd be allocating responsibilities, estimating timeframes, setting milestones, and broadly speaking, we would be continually planning, trying to figure out what still needs to be completed and how the software is going to look in its complete form. And we would constantly return on a weekly or bi-weekly basis purely to plan ahead. Not like hyper meticulously, not to nail down every trivial little thing, that's not what I'm saying, but to talk through software in high level terms with non-techie language to interrogate ideas. And you know why we did that? Why we were trained to do that? Well, there's a multitude of reasons. Good communication is the absolute cornerstone of any efficient development team. We need to let ideas evolve as good things become obvious and shitty things become relegated. Sanitize future work to make sure that we're not sinking time into something that's not necessary. Oh, hi there, Bohemia. What are you doing here? Off with you. Shoo. But like, why? Why were we doing this so much? Why so many meetings as a format? Well, frankly, because it's cheap. 
when your piece of software is just a bunch of high-level ideas, discussing those ideas requires little more than sitting in a room with some pens and post-it notes, or tickets in a database. And it saves money in the long term as you're able to dodge expensive critical code rework later. By navigating around the serious errors before we make them, we as a company can save a lot of money. This isn't me reinventing the wheel. This was just normal development when I was a part of it. Planning is not just cheap in the moment, but is really cost effective going forward. So I realise that that looks mental. I appreciate that fact. That sort of thing looks like some crazy conspiracy guy stuff, right? But like, the form of that, post-it notes listing features on a wall, to somebody like me? is really not that weird. Granted, in reality land, it wouldn't look like that. It would probably look much more like this. I can't actually click my fingers. I totally added that in post. But I'm an editor, fuck you, I can do whatever. Wow. But my point is more, that isn't that weird. Having a plan of what your piece of software is going to look like in high level terms, and it was desirable because it was cheap, simple, and doesn't result in a huge clusterfuck where features you developed in the first couple of months drastically conflict with features you introduced at the end. And granted, there are exceptions, such as situations where your customer might not entirely know what they want. And so building a small fit for purpose prototype is very useful in order to gather those requirements. But for an open world survival game with a story, especially one that was so heavily reliant on mystery and has a definitive ending, well that's not really something that one should be throwing at the wall to see what sticks, you know? Now though, I've long since moved on from this type of thing, putting software development behind me, and with the YouTube channel doing unexpectedly well, I became a full-time knob jockey. YouTuber, and on the side, I've also become an attention whore, live streamer on Twitch. And if you're streaming a particular game, you're often expected to comment on what you're playing. The reality of live streaming is that people want to know if what you're playing is good and fun, and whether or not it's worth their time and money, often in a sea of competing products just like it. And as a result, the complex questions of what exactly makes a good video game, what makes this one stand out, should I recommend this one in the face of other options, is always on the periphery, wrapped up in questions of personal taste and genre, leftover biases from my training, and observations on what the game market is clearly doing. These are just questions that I'm scooping out of a rabbit hole that's seen seemingly dug into the territory of being a gaming live streamer. And in that context, the forest is a success, right? Mr. Livestreamer? Uh... Playing the forest? Um... This is a good game? That's... <laughs> it's an intriguing mystery story that's set in a first-person horror simulator? Questions that are asked of me as I'm spinning in confusion, trying desperately to collate my thoughts at the end of this experience. Um... So... <laughs> in the face of such obvious evidence for, right? Overwhelmingly positive. It's out of early access. 1.0, they've delivered. They've even made a sequel. Years from now, when the dust has settled and metrics such as money made aren't worth a damn, you can sit a normie who's never played a survival game before in front of this and surely it will serve as a fantastic example of the genre, right? Well, frankly, no. I don't feel that's what's been delivered. To my eyes? This is a monument, a monument dedicated to the importance of planning. Because, like, it's so prominent, it's so well known, and yet it's so obviously busted in ways that can be remedied using methods that I know through my previous job experience were routine and inexpensive. That it's made me dedicate so much time to point at this thing and go, <laughs> What do we even say? What does anyone even say? It feels like you can only take a narrow view, look at one element in isolation and then praise it. Because if you stop to look at the whole, you realise it's just insane. This game, this product, this piece of entertainment, proudly presented in 1.0, has such an aggressive lack of planning in so many basic and obviously telegraphed ways that essentially it's become a typecast example of what can go hideously wrong if you develop without a plan. This video, I'm going to be talking about the dynamite thrower cannibal now he was originally added in update version 0.28 now all the textures for him have already been done in version 0.28d they removed the dynamite throwing cannibal they stated over the last few days we've been reading feedback as well as play testing here and finding that he really isn't fair or fun in his current state i don't think they balance tested him before they released him 
This thing shares reviews that are comparable to Outer Wilds. Are you kidding me? One could sit down and do a comparison between the two games, and I was tempted, but honestly, this video is long enough. But the Outer Wilds is an open world adventure game where its developers did sit down and do this. They did plan stuff out before they went through the expense of making it, carefully figuring out what players were going to learn and where. Each, each curiosity, I think, was going to have about three sort of connecting clues. The idea was the clues would point to each other and also point to the curiosity and have the clues. And that structure is like sort of still there, um, but we had added a bunch of other like clues pointing to clues, pointing to, you know, it, it got more complicated. And then they built the game around that planning. And as a result, when you finish it, the puzzle pieces slot together as, you know, they fucking should! And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, crazily prominent and visible right next to it, is the forest. And it's a game where you crash land in a plane, find bizarre goings on that tie into nothing, created by cannibals who are here just because, collecting drawings that were made by no child, seeing horrors that are presented to the player for no reason, collecting the belongings of missing people who will never be relevant, on a map that is literally backwards. This is what lack of planning can get you. And this is what I think the forest legacy should be. Something more important than just another open world survival game. It's a solid example of why planning can be so crucial. Whatever project you make in life, interrogate your ideas when they're just ideas. It will make all the difference. And the punchline? The joke, at least to me? is that all of this became so much more noticeable precisely because the forest developers added the story. Open world survival blew up entirely without it, with everyone having their own personal adventure in, you know, an open world sandbox. That was so fucking awesome, holy shit. They flew into the face of that to set up their own story, cutscenes included. But a story necessitates planning, necessitates setup and payoff, and it just shone a beacon on how little of that was actually happening. I want to reiterate for the emphasis, the plot that they added has nothing to do with the cannibals. Their behavior, their tribes, their looks, nothing. They glued this plot about corporate shenanigans onto the side of their survival game about cannibals, with about as much care as adding a katana stabbed into the side of people with I love New York t-shirts, and it was all arguably unnecessary. So genuinely, I'm really fascinated to play the sequel to The Forest, Sons of the Forest, which is apparently now available. This video took so fucking long to make that they actually finished developing it. I'm actually really fascinated to see if there's been a change in the overall approach, if time and a greatly expanded development team has led to a final product that's ultimately a lot more whole, memorable for reasons that aren't related to how bizarrely constructed it is, and put a pin in that for a potential follow-up video one day. Shorter video, holy shit. And I must admit, I do kind of feel guilty. I don't wish to go in so hard on what is essentially an indie dev. This isn't an Ubisoft or an EA. I don't mean to ridicule them. More just sum up my thoughts and point out how bizarre this is and try to encourage developers not to do this. Again, planning is cheap. Don't skimp out on it, whatever you do. So this is the part of the video where I just put a bow on it. I'd encourage you to pick up the forest and I still think you should. And perhaps you'll see things slightly differently. I do want to see the developer thrive, why wouldn't I? But you see, I don't want to end the video just yet. There's been this devious question in my mind, and it happens whenever I look at the pictures on my wall. Don't you crash. Oh, fuck's sake. Ugh. The draft post-it notes of the questions that I asked during my own live stream. Because as I look at it, I wonder... Adobe, why are you so shit? Well, yes, that. But also... Where does that take place? At the very top there. Well, I've mentioned it before now, haven't I? When I speculated whether or not open-world survival games with plots added in post would feel detached from the overall survival element. Obviously, in this case, the answer is yes, because the end game takes place in a secret lab, which is hardly the forest, and the start of the game is a plane crash. So that's kind of interesting, but, you know, who cares? Well, here's the thing. I've been staring at this wall for weeks. This one and this one. And this devilish question has been circling around in my brain. What happens if you just hard cut from the beginning to the end? Like pretend for the sake of argument that the red man grabs Timmy and then just runs out of the plane into a nearby building. What actually happens to the story? I mean, 
I can do that. I live stream the entire game. I have the footage. It would take merely a moment. So I did that. I stitched the two halves of the footage together. I got some dinner and then I just sat down and watched from there. It's not perfect. The fact that your character has a bunch of weapons and gear is a little inexplicable, and the context that Megan died before you entered this place is lost because those VHS tapes are outside. But for the most part, that doesn't really matter, because the plane crash and the Sahara Labs combined kind of set up and pay off everything that's going on in this game. The child experiments, the finding of the artifacts, the fact that they turn into these mutants, the fact that Dr. Cross works here and he's loopy and needs another child to make the machine work. The orientation video explains everything. Everything that's pertinent to the forest plot is both set up and paid off here. And for the gameplay outside, you're going to find a couple of things that line up with what's going on. But for the vast majority of your time, the items and factions that you encounter aren't working to build up intrigue related to this plot because they didn't plan out the structure at a high level. So it's not just what I said about the plot locations in Subnautica, it's way worse. The gameplay and plot areas are not merely geographically distinct, they're not aesthetically distinct, they're everything distinct. There's so little overlap. So in the end, why listen to me? Why listen to anything I've said about how the forest is a monument to the importance of good planning? Because, arguably, technically, you can cut out the forest from a game that's called The Forest and the plot is completely unaffected. Pre-production is very important.